Hi, everybody. Welcome back to my channel, Our Scientology Stories, Peeling the Onion. And my name is Mark Fisher, and I'm here today, and we've got a special video live stream for you. Uh, Janice is not here today because she's at a family wedding. So I asked somebody else to uh, come on that we can do a live stream with. Uh, he's an old friend of mine, and, and uh, we're going to talk about something that he and I have actually never really talked about in depth. And that's my escape from Scientology when I finally left in, in uh, 1990 and left the base for good. And uh, I want to introduce to you right now somebody that I'm sure you all have uh, seen before, and it's Gary Jackson Moorhead. Hi, Gary. How you doing, man? Hey, buddy. Hello, everybody. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, we've, we've seen each other several times since we left the Sea Org. Oh, but yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. But it's fun. We're, we're doing these channels, and this is broadcasting on both our channel as well as on your channel, Gary. And uh, how are you liking this YouTube world so far? Uh, it's an interesting navigation, I'll tell you that. <laughs> uh, yeah, actually, I don't know if I see this on my YouTube channel yet. I, I, uh, I don't know. What's that? I don't know if I, I'm just was looking to see if this showed up on my YouTube channel, but uh, yeah. I don't know. Well, we got 62 people in here right now so far. Tell everybody, tell us where you're where you're watching from in the chat, okay? And Goldie's in here, and want to thank yeah, Goldie hey, for Goldie. coming down and moderating. She does a Gorgeous great job. Gorgeous Goldie. <laughs> and Clearwater Chad is in the house. I see him in the chat. Yeah, Goldie says it's not on mine. North Carolina. North Carolina. Uh, Clearwater, yeah. Florida. Clearwater Chad, of course. I wonder and if it's not on mine because uh anybody else, any other places where you're at? Montenegro. Gosh, where's Portland, that? Portland Portland Metro area in Oregon, Suffolk in the UK. Portland, Oregon. Is that up where you're at? You're part yeah, of Yeah, that's uh Portland Metro. Yeah, that's just up the street from me. I'm out here in southeast near Clackamas. Johnson Creek okay, area. Moorhead, Moorhead uh, said Minnesota, I think. Jacksonville, Florida. Yeah. Uh, greeting 10 miles. Canadian, Lancaster. Of Goldie. Lancaster, California. The Netherlands. Holy smokes. Hey, we're reaching over to Europe. Kansas City, Phoenix, Spain. August. Boston, uh, Iowa. Yeah, yeah, we're up to 78 viewers right now. Essex, England. That's fantastic. Funny Face 79 is in here. <laughs> and uh, Bakersfield, California. Germany. Brother and Cleveland, Ohio, and Iowa, and uh, anyway, it's great. We're, we're glad you all are here. Uh, I just wanted to mention, too, that uh, if you want to, uh, feel free to super chat or super sticker in here. Uh, we appreciate any donations from that. You know, we're providing the content, and it's providing me, like, we bought new cameras, Janice and I, and all that, so yeah. if you want to super chat, please do so. Super sticker us. That's great, too, and then, of course, always, as always we want to mention we want you to please subscribe to our channels okay uh in the description box of this video a live stream i've got jackson's uh youtube address and also our youtube address and i don't know about you jackson but we all need more subscribers right yeah uh, sure i mean it's nice to know that there's people out there that i'm actually uh affording some valuable information and hopefully some entertaining stuff while i do it <laughs> 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 that's right okay and we've got the comments going on here and uh we're all that so anyway if you've got any questions put them in the chat we're up over 100 people now and uh we'll be adding more and uh jackson before we get started on my escape story i just wanted to how long uh i remember you when you were just a teenager uh just, just a little punk i remember lady. meeting i remember seeing you in cmo in pack in los angeles when how old were you then <clears throat> So I would have been uh, 14, 13, 14. Yeah. yeah. I, would I, I have a specific picture of you, mental picture of you working. They had like a little galley area for um, yeah. the, for the international messengers, right? With Randy and Gomber. I just remember, I mean, you were a teenager then, and you yeah. were running around that area down there on the first floor of the main building. Am I right? Yeah, yeah. You remember Randy, the, uh, the steward? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I wasn't actually in the message at that time. I was a missionary because Miscavige was down there as the action chief CMO int, 
and they were doing um, a mission evolution where they sent missionaries to all the Scientology missions internationally. And so we were brought out there to get briefed and then fired out on our missions. Yeah. And uh, Miscavige and John Nelson were, I think, the mission ops, and I think Mark Engber was as well. Yeah, and, that was, uh, if for those listening and out that had been to uh, the Los Angeles organization, such as Advanced Organization Los Angeles or the Big Blue Building, where the canteen's currently located across the street from the uh, advanced organization. That's where I had first, uh, that's where I remember that the Action Bureau, Dave and everybody that ran the missions functioned out of was in that section when uh, they all moved to Los Angeles temporarily from the base, but. That's right, and then you, was Terry, Terry Gillum, Terry Gamboa, was she, uh, she was the commanding officer out down there, wasn't she? Terry was the COCMO pack, that's correct. Yes. Hey, Jackson, somebody's saying that you're half the volume of me. Can you can you get closer to your microphone again? How's this, folks? How's that? That's sound? better now. I can hear um, you better if you get closer to it. Yeah, I, uh, I'm going to I'm going to eventually get a boom. But um, so, yeah, I'm just yeah, those microphones are directional. So basically, yeah, they're awesome, too, microphone. at the same time. So, yeah, yeah, that that's now that closer to the mic. Yeah, it's that's much better. If you just stay close to your mic, that'll be great. OK, okay. anyway, um. And then, then the next time I saw you, Jackson, was uh, 1982 up at the Gold Base when uh, you were working on the uh, Star of California, the, uh, the swimming yeah. pool, right? That's correct. Star of yeah. California, May of 1982. <laughs> That's when I arrived. That's I actually uh, came up during that time for training. And then um, actually the Star Cal second that was the second time I came up to the base. And uh, uh, it was in the summertime. And I had... That's actually when I was transferred up there by Vicki Asnaran to go into the Religious Technology Center at the time and set up the what was called AVC or the Authorization Verification. Yeah, oh my gosh. But um, yeah, the, the renovations were going full bore because every they were getting ready for L. Ron Hubbard to come back, right? Well, that was, that no, was no, no, not not to, to from my recollection, Mark, what was simply going on was the Star of California, the entire base itself hadn't begun it's it's uh refacing redoing everything and and changing the colors and building everything out new furniture and all so oh so we got a puppy dog in the background that's my dog she's outside barking yeah sorry. buddy love the dogs <laughs> doesn't bug me one bit as you were saying no um, no at that time in 82 uh, may of 82 there wasn't much construction going on maybe general stuff but uh the, the key focus was on the star of California. Um, and, um, yeah, that I was yeah. aware of there, there may have been small construction going on elsewhere. I do remember sidewalks were getting, getting laid, uh, put yeah. down, um, around the property, but in terms of major construction, just the ship. That's all and, I you know, remember. Jackson, I saw you interviewed on another, uh, another podcast or another, um, uh, channel. And the way you described coming to the gold base the first time at Gilman Hot Springs was exactly the way I remembered it because yeah. I came in at night like you did, and there was one light on Highway 79. Yeah, it was the old guard shack, right? The old dog box, baby. That's that was the security handle for the main booth, which was on the radio was referred to as dog box. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and, and you drive up and there's just looks like there's a little light and there's no lights anywhere back in those days because the property was not lit at all. Yeah, and uh, it was out in the desert and you, I didn't even know there was mountains there until I woke up the next yeah, morning. Yeah, the next I, morning. Yeah, because yeah, you almost couldn't see your hand in front of your face. It's so richly dark. It was dark. so dark, literally. Yeah. I don't know how people walked at night. It was really dark. Well, it was amazing and it was actually amazing and cool and confusing, but more cool than confusing just because it was so silent and beautiful night, desert sky, rich stars. You didn't see that stuff in Los Angeles. So, yeah, and, and then, then the, having no flipping idea where you were. <laughs> it, well, exactly. And then, then I went, they put me to sleep in the old, the old guard house, you know, uh, the, uh, yeah, by, the garage yeah, house, by the garage, by the garage. It was called and the garage I woke house. up the next morning and I walked outside and you come right out that door and you see these mountains, you go like, they're not huge mountains, but you're like, whoa, oh. where'd that come from? <laughs> Called North. That What you were looking at was, uh, you know, I don't know if you ever come to knew it, but I certainly knew it like the back of my hand. It was called North Mountain. Yeah. That's the geographic reference. Mm -hmm. 
great. And then, uh, of course, then I saw, I went to uh, the dining area, it was called Massacre Canyon Inn, or we called it MCI. And I looked to my left up the hill and I saw a house. And I went, L. Ron Hubbard's up there because at the time, you know, we didn't know it was called Over the Rainbow. Nobody knew where it was at. And I just assumed he, that's where he was, right? Yeah. Was this the single story terracotta roofed? white house uh beautiful section of the property amongst all those uh um eucalyptus trees with the koi pond out back and the little house in which paco stayed in the housekeeper right and it was uh it was called bonnie view uh bonnie view bb for short bonnie view because it had a good view and lrh thought it looked like the area looked like the scottish highlands so that became the motif for the base when they did the renovations um but that house up there, I, I learned very quickly that L. Ron Hubbard was not there. <laughs> no, but, um, you know, because I held watch up there uh, and basically for at least eight hours a day, wandering, roaming around, watching for people trying to intrude the property, um, I part of my watch was also going in and through the house to make sure nobody was in it or no wandering staff member was in it. So I got to see... The bedroom, the bathroom, the kitchen, the closets, the what was inside the fridge, all the time, you know. And and uh, you know, a funny little story of, you know, when you see a food item sitting around uh, unaccounted for, but generally <laughs> accounted for, such as in his fridge, his, his fridge was empty except for cactus coolers because that was yeah. his drink of choice. Yeah, and there must have been five or six of them in there, and I. I can't tell you how many times I contemplated. Ain't no one's gonna notice one missing, and I, you know, I almost took the 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 dive to drink one of L. Ron Hubbard's favorite sodas out of his drink. And if I did, I knew what the hell that would be a uh, brought down upon me. But it was just comical. I definitely had that thought of God, a cactus cooler. I would be. Did I'd you ever have cool. a cactus cooler? They're actually they're sweet, but they're no, really they're good. they're yeah, they're cool drinks. Uh, you know, and I can see why you liked them. It was like the uh, the early version of Mountain Dew. Yeah. Or squirt, you know. Um, but yeah, cactus coolers are old school sodas. So that was his uh, uh, his soda of choice, just like yeah. cool unfiltered cigarettes were his cigarettes of choice. Uh, you just came to know and witness all these little things about L. Ron Hubbard that everybody attended to and make sure we're in the right place. And Right. And, Let uh, me, uh, but, be, well, before we go on, we're up to 165 viewers. Welcome, everybody. If you haven't subscribed to our channel, in the descriptions, there's uh, the destination for both uh, Jackson's channel and my channel. You go ahead and subscribe and also like, hit that like button. And also, if you have questions, please, please, it makes it easier for us to find. If you type the word question before your chat comment, it makes it easier for us to not miss your question. Or oh, uh, if yeah. you want to super chat us or super sticker us, please do so. Uh, we appreciate any donations that you send our way. And uh, anyway, I just want to let you know that uh, before we get going here. Now, hey, Jackson, I just remembered yeah. something. Go ahead. In, in, when I came in the summer of 82, do you remember when we had when there was a fire? I know you're a firefighter, right? Yeah. No, Later. I know. that. Was, I'll uh... never forget. We were on renos. We were on renovations. Yep. You know, the whole base on Saturdays. Yeah. Uh, shut down except for uh, everybody had to go and do renovations or grounds work or something at the property. And uh, I'll never forget, we were down in the, in the MCI having lunch and uh, a fire, actually, some kind actually of a was, fire came up, right? It, my recall, Mark, was it was actually during dinner. Um, it was during a meal time. But what I was, remember is I've never run dinner. so fast. Everybody ran to get up. It was up above the villas yeah, uh, well, outside our property, right? Yeah. Um, first, we were all in Massacre Canyon. And uh, remember the parquet floor used to be roped off? Yeah. Um, the parquet floor being the dance, the original dance floor for Massacre right. Canyon Inn. We took a lot of pride in that and a lot of respect was paid to it. There was always somebody working yeah. on it to keep it fresh. But anyways, we were all in there eating. And I'll never forget Sheldon Mussel, his British accent and blonde hair. And he used to not wear much of a shirt during the week weekends. So he came running in and announced that there was a fire on the north side of the property. And um, later to discover there was fire on the north side of Highway 79 at either end of the property on the east end and the west end, indicating somebody had intentionally started it. Um, and that activated us <clears throat> all emptying MCI. And there was probably... You know, I don't know what the, the the head count of the property staff, the, the base staff at the time, was at least three to four hundred people. 
it wasn't too big, but it wasn't. Yeah, it was too more small. on the small side. Yeah, yeah it was we more more small that. than what yeah. it eventually became. But uh, everybody all ran off to go get involved in whatever capacity. I don't even remember if there was an established thing, but I just remember that we had to go all go get shovels, and everybody ran to where they all personally knew a shovel to be, and then we all ran further down the highway to go down and do what we could to help put the fire out. And in particularly, you may remember Andy Yarrow. Yeah. The famous incident where Andy grabbed a rolled up inch and a half section of hose and with no nozzle nor can not connected to any water source went running up the hillside in his polyester black pants and his white he used to wear the white standard uniform shirt buttoned down mm-hmm. to like two buttons down and had his sleeves rolled up yep. and, and his uh, leather patent sh- work uniform shoes. And he was in this mental state of panic and went running up the hillside. Literally, uh, the, 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 the top of the mountain was, I think was like an 800, some 800 foot elevation. And he at least ran up half of it. And this was all loose dirt. While no established path to run up, he just grabbed this section of hose thinking he's going up there to connect to a water source to put this fire out. And it was just a matter of feverish. And I remember it uh, really pissing the fire department off so much so that he almost was arrested because he refused to come down. Yeah, Anyways. I remember that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that, yeah. that was that day and it went into the night. Yeah. And uh, it was very crude, unorganized, but kind of oddly organized. Um, and, you know, speaking from the fire department perspective, that was back in a day in which a lot of stuff was more crudely addressed as an incident. So, uh, there wasn't a lot of law enforcement around, no. mostly just fire department. There wasn't even aircraft involved. Um, well, uh, my, it, my, 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 my recollection as doing renovations, right, is sprinting as fast as we could yeah. from MCI up. And then getting outside was actually across from the G units where they yeah, were at up there. That's where we first And then started. we ran up there and then we just frantically were running like chickens were our head yeah. cow up the mountain towards the fire. And we had no, you no nothing, no mm. shovels, no nothing. And when we got up there, I'll never forget this because I've never seen a wildfire. I know you have many times, right? Yeah. But that fire jumped really quickly. It went from one spot to the next. I mean, I've never seen anything like that. I mean, it literally, we're lucky nobody got hurt. And it Oh, it's surprising. (laughs) I I call it the standard C organization, C org member compulsive response to something. At least you're there. You don't know what the hell to do. Cluster F without using the word. Cluster F, yeah. Yeah. Oh, it was it was worse than a cluster. Uh, but if there was a be a picture provided in any urban dictionary or dictionary about what a cluster F is, there would be a bunch of Sea Org members on that hillside trying to put out a vegetation <laughs> fire. They have no knowledge of what to do, but they're there. <laughs> it That's was very cool. odd. So, um, you know, that wasn't an unusual scenario back then. Very green and generic. Everybody was all these environmental issues. What do we do? How do we respond to them outside of doing the, the tasks that we are assigned? whether it was in a building or outside of a building, we were just a bunch of, um, you know, go-getting, go-getters. Tell me what to do. I'll go make the best effort of doing it. And that's what we tried to do every time. So right. the backbone of any Sea Org member. Make it go right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I do want, uh, you know, I do see people. I just, I don't know if there's something I'm not clicking on on my YouTube channel um, because, uh I don't know what Aaron did last time, Mark, to, I'm clicking yeah, on live. I, I don't know either. That's what we were trying to figure out beforehand. Yeah. But, These uh, are two new newbie homeboys trying to figure all this out, folks. So I'm sorry if um, some of you were at my channel. I didn't even know what I had to identify. They can go over to my channel if they have to. It's our, our Scientology stories, Peeling the Onion. We're at 200 viewers now. We're, okay. We're well, there's these. 200 people. I'm hopeful we're not confusing. But like I said... We're just a couple of brothers here trying to figure this out as we go, exactly. and eventually we'll be able to get better. So okay, um, so I I know your story about you know you then you eventually got on the security force. Rick Asnaran uh, constituted a security force. He was a safety officer who was quote unquote there to uh, be in charge of L. Ron Hubbard's security because uh, the idea was to get the base ready for L. Ron Hubbard to come back if they ever got an all clear 
legally so he could come back and shoot his movies and do his well yeah that was stuff. he was rick asneran uh for those who don't know um in the c organization he was the husband of vicky asneran who was one of i th- may have been the second inspector general the one of head of all of rtc after uh steve marlowe who was yeah. the original uh yeah vicky uh, was the deputy inspector general yeah um, and she and, mentioned... and steve marlowe was was basically inspector general and then annie broker was supposed to be the inspector general but she was off with l ron hubbard so yeah and that 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 all hadn't come into play yet but this is the early formative stages of religious technology center the, it, all the offices were located in the upper villas uh, geographically would be on the north side and just east of the star of California. Mm-hmm. And there was no official, um, you know, and again, that was, this is all the beginning stages of how, what's going to be where, who's going to be functioning where, which office, who's going to have their offices where, but everything was pretty much all the in- management was confined into three lodging type buildings, which basically were these resort type motels um and they probably had let's see each upper middle and lower lodge had i think about eight offices on either side of them so there may have been about 16 total offices you mean the villas right yeah within the villas the upper yeah. middle and lower villas you said yeah. the lodge the lodge yeah, yeah, because we referred to the upper middle yeah. and lower <laughs> well the upper and lower lodge because there was no middle lodge yeah. um but anyways these were the original administrative offices of all where all the church executives worked and some right. of them actually lived, and even Dave himself. But um, uh, Rick Asneran was assigned base security uh, responsibility, and he, um, at that time, there wasn't an actual security force established. There was a, uh, a basically a, what in the Sea Org terms we had the watch quarter and station bill, which basically is a listing of what. All the second duties any Sea Org member themselves could be called to do at a moment's notice, and it would be a short-lived little project or event. Um, it all derived from the Apollo at sea, where, like, if they pulled into a dock and they would be loading or unloading goods, everybody would come down from the normal task, partake in this drill, this watch quarter and station bill to help unload or load the goods onto the ship or off of the ship, and then once completed, they all go back to the normal job. So having the Sea Org move to land, um, uh, the nature of the Sea Org environments required to have this watch quarter and station bill. So security was an aspect of that. And um, at that time, back in the early 80s, we just had general volunteered Sea Org members assigned to patrol the property and sit in the main booth. And we didn't even have an actual metal motorized gate that opened and closed. It was a string strung across an opening between the chain link fence and they would just drop the rope it literally ran outside through a hole in the side of the old main booth we'd unravel it from a nail let it get slack somebody would drive over the rope go in and we pull it tight again and wrap it around the nail. i don't even remember a fence around the property well there was initially a long and i don't know if we're going to go down that path right now but i'm no we're not uh, we're not now uh rick asneran yeah he was um he he was Mr. Southern Texan, wore cowboy boots, had a swagger about him. He was a good yeah. guy. Yeah. Um, but he was also married to Vicki Azran, so he by nature had a lot of a lot of leverage to swing around and right. Uh, um, so he progressively started a, you know, working and building up security and then eventually the day did come where uh, we are going to establish an official security force. Mm -hmm. And an issue came out identifying who those people were going to be because initially it was just Kenny Siebold, Matt Pesh, and Jim Cup that were full-time security guards. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, we had no radios, no self-defense, no handcuffs, no procedures, no policies. (laughs) And Rick Azarin had a lot to do with establishing all that initially. So. Um, he, he put together this whole thing and I became part of it. I was part of the, uh, after Kenny, Jim and Matt's initial involvement in security, the security force was formed and I was one of those initial guards and, uh, security took off like a wildfire in terms of, uh, its involvement with uh, the base and its staff and, um, the history of that international base. And then it bled down through the lower organizations down in Los Angeles. And then eventually, 
uh, internationally through all the main C organization organizations around the world. Right. Um, that standard was set at the base and and sent out to the rest of the organizations. No, you're right. Now, I uh, eventually not a, not a, not at first in 1982, but eventually it was in um, uh, the fall of 1983 is when I became. Uh, set up an office for David Miscavige called the Corporate Liaison Office. It was based off of uh, a L. Ron Hubbard advice to set up a, uh, an office that helped him, at, uh, meaning David Miscavige, as well as Author Services, which was in Los Angeles. And they were the, the uh, for-profit corporation to handle L. Ron Hubbard's interests, his books, his movies, his this, his that, yada, 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 all of his legal stuff and all that stuff. But anyway, um, L. Ron Hubbard didn't want to pay for that. So he came up with the idea of having the church set up a corporate liaison office up at the Gold Base and also in Los Angeles that would help handle because the author services and Miscavige had, they had interests for L. Ron Hubbard in the church and it was part of the corporate sort out. But anyway, so I was picked, I was working for Vicki Asneran at the time in, in the uh, Authorization Verification and Correction Unit, and she recommended me and Miscavige picked me to be in charge of that office. It was David Miscavige and Shelley. They basically were together. And uh, I had to set up the office up at the Gold Base as well as in Los Angeles. And my initial staff were myself, uh, a guy named Jason Bennick, who I know you know, and uh, Jackie. Jackie True, who's now Jackie Wolf. Um, and then we had Jure Rathbun, who she wasn't Jure, she, she was Jure Jory, and she Jure Jory. Yeah, Jure she name. married Marty Rathbun, and then yeah. eventually Rick Cruz. But anyway, we had Jure in there up at the uh, the base up. Um, that was our office up there at uh, Gold. And then in LA, I had a, a, a woman named Liana Klingler. Yeah, and, uh, she I actually had a, came uh, up. Uh, Hans Henrik Peterson. Yep, and and uh, they up. were based out of Los Angeles. And then Jure would go back and forth between Los Angeles and Gold Base based on when Dave and Shelley were back right. and forth. And in those days, Dave Miscavige and Shelley were mostly in Los Angeles. They would come up maybe for a weekend every other week or once or twice a month or or sometimes it could be weeks, right, Jackson, before they yeah. would come up to the base. Well, he always and, came back and forth in that black van, that old black Chevy van. Yeah. They had a black Chevy with the captain van chair and, in the back and yeah. everybody else sat on the carpeted floor. I just wanted yeah. to mention really quick, just like you saw yeah. this, like, holy smokes, we got somebody from Florianopolis, Brazil. <laughs> holy smokers. Yeah, that's great. We're at 216 <laughs> viewers right now, Excuse and uh, we appreciate everybody in here. Again, if you have questions, write question on it, put it in the chat. If you want a super chat, a super sticker, it's great. Do we do we want to look at the uh, answer some of these questions? We're, we're going know? to we're going to do the slideshow first, and then we'll go to the questions. Okay, okay, it's it's your show, brother. I'm following the lead. Yeah, no problem. But anyway, um, so basically, we had the office, and Miscavige and Shelley would go back and forth. So there'd be long periods of time where I'd be working on stuff up at the in base for Miscavige. Savage. And uh, to be honest with you, most most gold staff members will tell you that it was much more pleasant when he wasn't there at the base. Uh, they could do their jobs and they didn't have to worry about him. And uh, one of the things that I, you know, when he was coming up, uh, we made sure that we, meaning my office, we made sure that we had things for him to approve, things for him to do. And I would coordinate with gold and with the estates and uh, and also with security too to make sure the base looked great, right, right, Jackson. I mean, yeah, we made and sure. I mean that's such a. I mean, you're speaking this, and my mind's going 100 million minutes of all yeah. the little history attached to it. Yeah. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm just trying to give of, a summary. A summary. Sure. Yeah, and and uh, I I think it's, and again, this is more along the line of why I decided to do my own channel just to help give yeah. a backstory to a lot of little things but at that time around the ship this is my witness and and you know i'm sure yours too mark to a lot of not only getting to know the people of the international management organization more for me it was i got to know these people as people not the significance of their jobs right and that, that the tasks they did i was just like i knew you as mark i knew julie as julie you know I see there's some pictures and there's people's like, yeah, I just remember them as them. And then the second thought was the jobs that they did. But, you know, Dave, it, you speak of this, that van rolling up and, you know, randomly he used to come down walking around down in flip flops in his robe with a cup of coffee from his birthing and just come down early in the morning as the sun's just coming up to say hi and hang out with us. Right. As guards, you know, but, um, 
uh, you know, the, the, that those formative stages of the imp base were kind of kind of key from my perspective of this, the imp base was that the imp management was kind of fumbling around finding its own way of what they're going to do and how they're going to do. You know, there was an initial a general structure. But it all finally came into play later on. You had an integral part of that from the corporate liaison, as you were just referencing. And that, uh, you know, that was a, a pivotal role and turning point of the game and the activities that we found ourselves doing. And how Scientology, right. those that are down in Los Angeles or in Europe or in Canada or in Brazil even, <laughs> um, uh, found themselves th of the offerings that started at that imp base, the ideas yeah. that started there, right? Yeah. And so, when, yeah. When I was, oh, I'm sorry. What I was going to say was that, you know, when they were going to come up for a weekend, our goal at the corporate liaison office was to have a flapless weekend, meaning yeah. they come, they do their thing, they get serviced, they're happy with the base, and they go back to Los Angeles. And that's, right. that, that was like the goal. And we used to achieve that goal quite often. And uh, we did not want him to blow up and explode, but of course he could from time to time. Right. But, um, you know, that was basically my job. And I, I know you and I interacted quite a bit. And it, do you recall what I was like to work with and what to, to deal with? In well, you days? were just always this gentle dude that rode around on his motorcycle <laughs> and, and would happily show up and say, Hey, what's going on? And everybody knew what, what and who you represented. Right. And uh, it wasn't a matter whether they were looking to give you the right or wrong answer they just genuinely interacted with you and, and helped afford you the information you were looking for or took direction that you were there to pass on. That's right. You were just a good soul dude. And, uh, I also do remember that, uh, this guy's got it pretty good. He got himself a car. Uh, doesn't seem to be stressed. No. You just rode around on your bike all the time. You were kind of like the middleman. Um, you may have gotten yelled at, but nobody was yelling at you directly. So, but you would get yelled at by the left hand and have to deliver that yelling to the right hand. And they never, the right hand never saw. Right. Never I, saw I that actually, yell. I play good cop. I mean, yeah. I don't really oh, yeah. recall yelling like Miscavige would get upset about something in gold and he'd be yelling at the staff. And then I would come down and go, okay, let's figure out how to. Yeah, how to exactly. Right and here. that was basically the way I witnessed you. And then yeah. Jackie and, and Jason, Jason, Jason was a firecracker. I would bet that you probably had to have your own little leash on that guy. Yeah, and, and, and I would hear dude. stories after the fact that he could be a real a-hole. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't really realize that, you know. And then when he was eventually in gold, he really was an a-hole. And I I, yeah. I didn't he I didn't experience that with, with him at me. But he was a ball of energy. Yes, he certainly was. And it, just his demeanor, it's kind of like you walk up on a dog and – their demeanor, their natural demeanor is like, that thing could bite me. Where other dogs, you just could tell, it's like they just looking for a good pet, yeah. you know? But yeah. Jason was that type of guy. He was a sharp, well, well-dressed, well-mannered, but very sharp and quick. And, uh, he, yeah. Yeah. He was more I, nice I, than he was mean, I'll say that. But he yeah. definitely had a Well, that leads me way. to, you know, uh, my escape and what happened and all that. Because I've never talked to you about it because... Uh, in, it was in 1990. I'm, I'm going to go through some of the history regarding that, and we're going to show some photos. But I got married to uh, Julie Catano, and she – hold on a second. I'm going to let my dog in one second. Sure. In the meantime, hello, those from uh, around the world. I saw somebody from Vancouver, Washington. That's just across the river from me. And Yeah, and uh, somebody asked the question, what is a flap? A flap is like something like an occurrence, like, you know, something bad happening that would be called a flap. You know well, what I mean? Well, yeah, let's keep it. I like to put an analogy, like if you're at home cooking dinner and your whole family is sitting at the table ready for food and you open up the oven and uh, the roast that you spent hours roasting, suddenly you find it burnt. Well, that would be a flap because now you can't <laughs> feed your family. So compare that to a production driven environment. Anything that suddenly went awry would be a yeah. flap. Yeah, exactly. If that helps. Anyway, I got married to Julie. Uh, uh, she was a long term messenger. She had been on the flagship Apollo and uh, and she was a beautiful girl. And uh, anyway, she also when I got together with her, she was the watchdog committee member for gold for the golden era productions. And she held that position for a long time. Yeah, and what so was she we, four foot. 
ten or something. No, she was five one, but her hair was yeah. No, long that's why I was going to ask because she was notoriously known for her long hair went down past her ass. Exactly, and she either braided it or it was out strung out, and it just yeah. I'm going to show a photograph of her in a second. Yeah, but yeah, no that so so we dealt. She and I dealt together all the time. Dealt with each other with gold because she was the watchdog committee member for gold. And of course I was dealing with stuff with Miscavige. Anyway, we eventually ended up getting married and right. I'm going to show some pictures here. Okay. Cause, uh, uh, of, of that and tell some stories. That's me back in the day, a uh, lot younger, a lot thinner. Okay. Still Strapping the same little height. dude. You know, so yeah. we all parted our hair down the middle too. I think yep. I still do. Same, I still yeah. have hair. How luckily. Yeah. I think, uh, <laughs> and then that's me. And that's my wife. There my is ex-wife, Julie. Julie. And uh, like I said, uh, she she was a great girl, and uh, and uh, you know she dealt. We we had a great relationship. We ended up being married for over six years, and we never had any problems. And I'll go into that as as we go through this story. So, and that's that's Julie and me. We went to Hawaii. This was one time we went. We actually took a leave, which was unheard of in a lot of times in the Sea Organization. We went over there to uh, do a wedding. Greg Johnston and Jenny Johnston were getting married. They got married in Hawaii. Yeah, they got married in Maui, oh, wow. and uh, and uh, so Julie and I went over there on vacation, and uh, I was the minister. I was the minister. Um, we got they got married on a sailboat off the coast of uh, Lahaina. So that's that's what this picture is from. Golly! Um, and uh, this is when I got married. This was in October of '84, and uh, that's me and and Julie. We got married at the Star California. Yeah, I remember that um, on a Sunday, and we did it during CSP time, which was basically the time of the day when staff could do their laundry and cleaning. So, cause we wanted people to come. And uh, the funny thing was, is we got married. Uh, it was the exact same date that the International Association of Scientologists was formed in St. Hill. And uh, Miscavige, I had asked him to, to be my best man and, uh, and uh, be part of the wedding party, but uh, he couldn't be there. Be- he, we accepted, but then he couldn't be there because the, they decided they were gonna open up and start the IAS. So that was the day we got married. And uh, the minister was Phoebe Maurer, who was a longtime Sea Org member. And Gosh, man, wife. Phoebe. Yeah. yeah. And then this, there we are right there. Over my shoulder with the mustache is Jason Bennick. And then uh, to the left of the photo is Andre Tabayoyan, who was a real good friend of mine. And great also, guy. Yeah. And great, I had a lot of guy. dealings with him, with the renovations and the building of the music studio and, and all sorts of stuff. And, Who's in the uh, far back? The two dudes in the white, the one with the tie and the open collar. I don't know. I can't see that far back. I'm okay. Blind. But anyway, so this was our wedding day. And then this is our wedding uh, party. Yeah. And uh, left to oh right, that's Jason Bennick, then Andre Tabiayan, then Jesse. Jackie Prince, and John, John McGinley, McGinley, and Hans Heinrich Peterson, who yeah. worked in my office, and Gary, Gary Conley, who had been at the base for a long time. And then, uh, then there was me, the, my wife, the little girl is Rowan Horowitz, who was L. Ron Hubbard's granddaughter. If you have your mouse to help walk through, is it going... doesn't show? I can't oh, really okay. do it. Okay. So then, if you go to the right of my wife Julie, my um, is Lisa Schroer, uh, Lisa Allen, who, uh, I, was, as far as I know, is still there the and later became the CEO Gold, and I've heard horror stories about her. Wicked. And then to her right is Carol, Carol Burke, Burke, then Jenny Johnston, Fleur Thomas. And then there's Jackie, Jackie True, Jackie Wolf. And then on the end, on the right, is Michelle Yeager, who was my wife's best friend. Yeah. And she she was married to Mark Yeager, and she worked in the uh, Commodore's Messenger Org. And this was a mixture of people that worked in Gold, the Commodore's Messenger Org, as well as in RTC. So yeah, we they were all the church. Variety. All those people were int executives in one capacity or another. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, and from us low lifes in Gold, they were kind of – considered untouchable no matter how hot all those ladies were <laughs> couldn't touch them there was definitely a a, 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 cla- a, a click, click system or whatever yeah. pass system they yeah. call it you know like if you're an rtc then there was cmo then there was gold you know but I, I gotta be honest with you uh jackson i never considered you know everybody always looked down on gold stuff. yeah oh gold sucks gold's terrible this yeah. i never acted that way no, I, I, I know and the demeanor was very obvious uh, yeah. but you know people i never forget when i la- left finally um you know i i was taking a session where'd you get the idea that everybody in gold stinks and sucks yeah i said i know where i got it i got it from david miscavige yeah. and, and i got it from l ron hubbard who used to write about it and all that yeah. you know 
Anyway, that's Julie and me. And Michelle. That's in the back patio, and you said you were there, right? Yeah, I was there with that group photo, that you, just the mm. previous slide, and uh, and you guys cutting the cake. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. it was a, that was a hot summer summer day. There's only two two seasons in Southern California. That's night and day. <laughs> <laughs> Out in the desert, the upper and lower desert, which we were part of the uh, upper desert, the... Uh, it was uh, definitely in the hundreds as a routine yeah. during the summer times. Okay. All right. So this brings me to my first, when I finally decided to escape. Okay. Sure. Now, uh, I was working for David Miscavige, right? And uh, this is David Miscavige, what he looked like in that time period. This is in 1990. All right. And I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go into tremendous detail because we'll be here all day if I tell the story. But basically... Um, Julie, my wife, had gotten assigned to the Rehabilitation Project Force from WDC Gold. And I this was early in 1990, and I vehemently disagreed with it. It was done without a committee of evidence, and uh, I didn't know what was going on. But I found out. I knew it was coming from Miscavige, and uh, he denied it to me. But, you know, I knew it was, and it turned out that that's what happened. So I was really upset. She got assigned to the Rehabilitation Project Force and was out at our other property at Happy Valley. Uh, on the RPF. Well, because I was so upset about it, I got removed and put on the decks on doing ma manual labor, basically cleaning stuff around the base and that type of thing. And I was off and then was getting security checking and confessionals and all that stuff because they knew that I had disagreements with that, right? Who I was your buddy assigned to you when you're doing that? Somebody was assigned to watch you. I, I, I when I was on doing that deck work, was I, was the on, area I was on with Milt Wolf and uh, Ron Norton, uh, Milt Wolf had been the commanding officer of the Free Winds, and Ron Norton was something at the FSO or whatever. And we were doing, we were just doing, you know, we weren't, I, I didn't know if we were under watch or not, but we were just doing cleaning and just that side. I remember Bill Dendu somehow being in there as well. Yeah. But, well, the uh, reason I asked, because it was, again, this, your, yours, your scenario was the, how do we deal with these folks? And initially we would use, the work assignment areas as the people responsible such in this case i'll refer to the motor pool area where i remember one time you were working and the motor pool staff were responsible for watching you if you want oh, them I to see. work for you help get caught up that was uh, in in an effort to be uh, do the lack of security guards or a staff member we can pull off their regular tasks yeah. just to specifically watch mark but yeah. well anyway anyway we got put um um, I got put back on post. Okay. I got, I got cleaned up enough that I was put back on my post. Right. And, um, when I was put back on post, it wasn't shortly thereafter that Julie in the RPF, I, David Miscavige pulled me outside and said, Mark, I need you to do me a favor. I said, what's up, sir. He says, Julie wants to leave the Sea Org. She wants to route out and leave the Sea Org. She was in the RPF at Happy Valley. And I need you to go out there and handle her to stay. Okay. Now, of course, I didn't want my wife to leave and all that. Right. In retrospect, I wish I had said, let's go, right? But um, I went out there to handle her. And apparently, I didn't know this at the time, but apparently Julie and David Miscavige, before he married Shelly, they had been boyfriend, girlfriend. So he had a connection to Julie that I didn't, I wasn't aware of. That had to have been way back early back 80s before, and late the 90s. 80s at W, back at W. Okay. okay. So okay. anyway, so I went out and handled Julie. So then th shortly thereafter, uh, Julie's brother, Paul, uh, it, his, her family lived in San Diego area. Uh, Julie's brother was also on the security force there at Golden Era Studios working for you. And his name was Kevin Catano. And I'm going to show a picture of Kevin here in just one second here. And oh, that's you back in the day. Sorry about yeah. that. Um, I went the wrong way. I'll get it right. That's you back in the day when you were yeah. you were the security chief back then, right? In that, the, that was that. Yeah, yeah. That's probably when I was security chief. Yeah. Okay, and then uh, hold on, Maybe my fingers working right here. Okay, that's Julie's brother Kevin, Kevin Catano, and this more is years current. later. This is years later. Yeah, that's a more over the last <clears throat> five years picture. Yeah, and uh, anyway, Kevin was just a security guard. He just wasn't hadn't been at the base for very long. No. But anyway, uh, so we were we wanted to go to uh, Julie's brother Paul's wedding in San Diego, and it was around Memorial Day, end of May, that type of thing, right? So anyway, 
we went to the wedding, okay? That's a picture of me and Julie. That's not at the wedding, but I'm just trying to use that to show it up. And there's Kevin again, all right? Uh, the reason we were able to go is because Kevin was a security guard. I would be driving and I was trusted. I had my own car. And we were taking Julie, who was in the rehabilitation project force, with us. And we got approval to go to the wedding. So we drove down to, um, down to San Diego for the wedding. At that same time, and I'm not going to go into all the tremendous detail, at the base itself was when the high-speed copy line, the Gauss line, which you remember, Jackson, mm -hmm. uh, had miscavige had blown up about the, the uh, copy line, that they were producing all these, these tapes that were not adequate to his standards. And literally, he had them throw out about $300,000 of cassette tapes uh, that had been manufactured because they weren't up to his standards. Just like okay? that, yeah. Yeah. And so that whole production line, it was taking weeks for the technicians to get it up to a standard where he would give it a pass. OK, that's all I'm going to go into on that because it's very involved. But anyway, we were down in San Diego for this wedding. Right. And uh, sorry, we were down in San Diego for the wedding. And Miscavige at that time was at the um, free winds. He was at the, the Scientology ship down in the Caribbean. Well, he wasn't due back till Monday evening, and this was a Sunday. Well, sure enough, after the meeting, wedding of Sunday afternoon, I get a page. This is before cell phones or anything else, but we had to wear beepers. And it was Shelly Miscavige. And I called, and she said, uh, Fisher, you need to get back to the base right away. Um, Dave's coming back tonight, not tomorrow. And the, gals, the manufacturing line is still screwed, and you're going to be in big trouble. So I went, okay. So I got it back in the car and we started driving back. And the whole way back, I'm thinking to myself, you know what? I've just spent two days with my wife. I just want to be back with her. And, uh, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do. This is crazy. I'm, I'm going nuts, right? And so I decided without telling Julie or Kevin, I decided the only way I could be really be with Julie was go to the RPF with her. So what I'll do is I'll go back to the base and I'm actually going to blow with the intention of coming back. OK, and so that's what I did. I came back to the base and this is my car that we had. We had a little I had a little Honda CRX, which was really quick and uh, dropped Julie off at Happy Valley. And then I went to the villas where I had where we had a room. I got some things and then I drove up to the gate and I said, I'm going into town to security. And of course, they would never question me. And off I went and I yep. took off. and um, I, I'm going to go just I'm going to get to you in just one second here. I drove off and I went, I had no plan. And I ended up going down to South Coast Plaza in Irvine, California and checked into the Westin Hotel, which was a high end hotel. And I paid cash because I knew that you guys would track any credit cards or anything mm -hmm. like that. And I checked in under an assumed name because my intention was to go take a couple of days off, come back and go to the RPF. Now, I knew that once I was gone after about an hour or two, you guys would know that I was gone. So can you tell me, cause I've never talked to you. Do you remember when I left that first time and what happened at your end? Well, uh, what year was that again? 1990, May of 1990. Okay. Yeah. I was still a watch chief, so I wasn't so much in, you know, and that's just the pecking order security guard to a watch chief, watch chief mm -hmm. over five guards and then I uh, deputy security chief and then security chief. Um, I wasn't necessarily in on a lot of the no's except uh, when it became time for everybody to get involved. So I do remember the the wagon being rattled that Mark Fisher had blown. Um, and that was that was surprising, right? Because I was of, not. Yeah, of course. You would suspect. Yeah. Well, and then, of course, the, uh, the 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 bone rattling realization that it was us guards that let you go. And it was kind of um, how could he just drive out of the gate? Well, he was Mark Fisher. <laughs> and he's in the corporate liaison office. What do you expect me to say or do? Yeah, nobody would have said anything. No, nobody would have challenged us. So it was kind of, um, we had no reason to not let you go or question your departure or whatever. So you used that card, that safety card. Yeah. <clears throat> and, you know, there was people that followed suit later, years later on. But um, that was the answer. I think, and it was Mike Sutter. Michael Sutter was one of Dave Miscavige's henchmen. There he is. There's right the picture. There. Uh, he was pretty much the internal toss him the hot potato. He was expected to take care of 
you know, current and, and current major issues. Somehow, uh, I don't know how, but this Mike Sutter was, look at me. He had this really backbone about him that uh, it, he didn't take ownership of the stuff that he was assigned to. He got himself involved to make himself look good as far as I'm concerned and haphazardly made his way through dealing with these hot potatoes. So here's Mark Fisher, hot potato, Mike Sutter himself trying to learn how to deal with all this, but he was the one directly responsible uh, to reporting to Dave Miscavige. And yeah, I, and Mike, Mike was in the Religious Technology Center, yes. of course. Dave was the chairman of the board of, of RTC. And the security force was at Mike's beckoning call to, he would just send us off to go do random things. So I was caught up in those random things. I do remember um, when it was found out where you were staying in Hemet. Um, I do remember driving around uh, the South Bay area. Uh, it was always a luck of the draw. Get in a car, go somewhere. At least we can tell Dave we're on the road looking. Right, and, and this um, this was before you created the blow drill, right? That happened yeah, this before, is the right? developmental stage over the years to what what later became actually identified as the successful steps that we took to find people. So you know, still in the throes of how do we go about doing this? I didn't have access to Mark Fisher's world. I do remember going through your birthing the where you and Julie lived in the lodges yeah. and having to pull from it bills, any personal pieces of information, recent receipts, yeah, any any documented evidence outside of your actual clothes that would give us a, a hint or an idea as to where to go look for you. So well and then from my end of things, I knew how you guys looked like most yeah. people would be train stations, bus stations, uh, airports, all that. Sort of. So I stayed away from those places knowingly. And then I also knew that you guys would track credit cards. So like I said, I took out cash and I had money. I mean, when I worked for Miscavige and RTC, I had money. So And, and Mark, um, let, let's highlight yeah. how it is that you knew, not being in security, how security found people. Because because I work for Dave and Shelley Miscavige. And Dave was always constantly getting reports on yeah. how and what was being done to find people. Exactly. That and was Shelley, the only way in which Shelley you was, knew. Shelley was involved too. I know you guys yeah. you guys kept in touch with her because she had to report to uh, Dave. Dave and Miscavige. And uh, yeah, so I knew that. So I went. I just wanted to highlight to our listeners how yeah. another, here's another confirmation, uncollaboratively proof that Dave Miscavige, OSA, um, who's listening and watching this, that we know that Dave Miscavige has a hands-on approach to anything and everything of the staff members, their whereabouts, their concerns, and in this case, Mark Fisher being somebody who was a close connection to him is now a loose cannon at rough seas in Dave's mind and thus uh, would have a hands-on 24-7 uh, every second of every day until Mark was brought back concern right. is to your and, whereabouts so and to be fair to you since i knew that knew how you guys played the game it was unfair because i yeah. knew i knew exactly what to do that you would not expect yeah and and like i said my intention was to come back so literally the next day i called greg will i called the uh, he, then i got turned over to mike sutter and told him look i'm coming back i know you're looking for me i'm coming back to go to the rpf to the rehabilitation project force i'll be back in a couple of days don't don't bother looking for me yeah so i told them that and then i went shopping at south coast plaza to buy <laughs> black t-shirts black jeans work boots your own uh, uniform for the RPF. uniform for the rpf and the whole time i'm looking over my shoulder going security is going to be around here somewhere you know what i mean yes so then i took off and i went i went i, I went to the movies i go okay i'm going to be in the rpf i'm going to go see a couple movies and all that anyway eventually i called back to the base a couple days later and now it's mike sutter that i'm talking to and i said okay mike i'm coming in and i'll meet you out at happy valley and he said no no don't do that you don't need to go to happy valley uh come to the base and uh, we'll take care of you there and i said no no i need to go to the rpf i'll meet you there well, it turns out that I found out that uh, I found this out from Marty Rathman uh, years later, that when Miscavige found out that I wanted to go to the RPF, because he said, you can RPF his ass. He needs to right. go to the RPF, right? And right. that uh, when he found out that that's what I wanted, then it was like, oh, no, the RPF's too good for him. So when I got to the base at Happy Valley, Mike said, I don't know why we came out here because you're not going here. So they took my car and then they drove me back to the regular base. And I got put on the grounds as the deputy de-weeder, never to be de-weeder in charge, working under Joe Kaneen, 
who was a garbage I see staff her. member, yeah, um, pulling weeds around uh, MCI in the lodges. You know what I mean? And I yeah. was like, that was it, you know? Um, so that's what happened to me. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, you were also uh, an example of the routine being broken by Dave where uh, we knew as – part of our established policies that if you did this, that was going to be the result. And Dave started uh, creating his own decisions against the written policies in that if in your case, if you blew and you came back, well, part of the deal is you're going to end up going to the rehabilitation project force. Dave would customize each, each uh, recovery based off of the concerns with him, uh, how deep the concerns with him. If it was just a regular staff member that worked in the audiovisual line that Dave probably saw once a week and had verbalized interactions with, Dave wouldn't be so concerned about that. Uh, so that person would fall under the regular routines. You blow, you go to the RPF. Um, whereas if it was somebody in finance or somebody that worked for Dave on his personal staff, changes sheets on his bed, worked in his in internal office administratively, those folks would get customized uh, dealings and, and uh, programs to bring resolution to their quote unquote problem. And in your case, Dave was on the fly giving direction. No, don't send him to the RPF. I don't want, you know, I'm, I'm most likely thinking Dave was like, uh, I don't want to be too harsh on him. I want him, you know, gentle, here's a cake. We're going to put some frosting on it. And as Mark starts seeing that cake, he doesn't really like the cake. So Dave throws some more sprinkles on it and Mark's starting to like it. And Dave throws some cherries on it. And then Mark goes, ah, I like that cake. And, um, using this as an analogy, of course, but that's how Dave, uh, dealt with people such as Mark that were really a, closer to knowing the inner workings of Dave Miscavige and Scientology. So Mark, didn't have to endure with the RPF. And in this case, Mark's intention was to go to the RPF. Um, both Dave and Mark had unspoken intentions as to why <laughs> Mark didn't, you didn't tell Dave why you wanted to go to the RPF. Just let's get it over with. Put me on the RPF. I know that's where I'm going, but really uh, you wanted to go there simply to be with your wife. And Dave was paying attention to his own concerns. So, oh, no, I don't want, Mark doesn't need to go to the RPF. He's such a good guy, but, you know, he got a little problem. Let's put him down here and make it look good in Mark's eyes. And that was the conflict. Let you me know, ask guess, you this. Let me ask you this. You may not remember. Do you remember what what happened with Julie? Like, she was in the RPF when I left. I was gone for three or four days. Do you recall, or was that sub handled by somebody else? I'm handled by sure somebody, somebody else. Somebody, somebody must have talked to her. Oh, right? absolutely. She would have been uh, 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 lassoed and brought in and, first of all, debriefed on where she thought Mark would go. So, um, And also about the wedding, probably, that we had just been at, right? Sure. You know, whatever. Yeah. And, you know, we'd be surveying her world and her views of, of what do you think is going through Mark's mind? Where do you think he would go? Did you guys have any difficulties? What is his weaknesses? What are his strengths? What is his interest? How much money do you guys have? You name it. That all would have been cold and pulled from her to then turn around and be used to figure out where the hell you were. And then if we find found you, uh, she would be kept on standby for the, uh, maybe she would be used to hang a carrot out in front of your right. face. Here's your wife. She wants you to come back. Um, you know, she literally would be used as a tool by the church. Right. And that and, was my carrot. That's why I went left. Yeah, I wanted to go course. be with her. Okay. So, so then to, to move forward. Okay. Quickly. Um, Ms. Cabbage made a mistake shortly thereafter where he put out an issue to the whole base. And I have a copy of it, which when you were searching my stuff, I actually snuck it in my pocket and took it out <laughs> and later just after my last escape. But anyway, canceling, he put out an issue to the whole base, canceling every certificate I, he didn't do it. He had Lynn Somerville do it, canceling every certificate and every course I'd ever done in Scientology. Okay. And I was right. crushed. To nullify like he, you as he a. He pushed it too far. Like, yeah. you know, a lot of times, you know, people would get in trouble and, you know, he, he'd put you, curb you, you know, like you said, and, and, you know, eventually they come around. Well, he pushed me over the edge at that point because I had spent 17 years in Scientology at that point, and I was on my uh, OT7, and I was at OEC FEB. I was highly trained, and basically, he put the, the thought in my mind, like, 
this is, well, now I'm thinking about leaving because if I got to redo all this stuff anyway, I may as well do it out in the real world right. where I can make money and do what I want. I don't have to put up with this crap anymore. And, so and you made a mistake doing that. Okay. And so little, I just wanted I to add, I'm sorry, ahead. Mark. I sorry, wanted to add to the significance of what you just explained of Dave taking away all your hard worked for and achieved accomplishments. Yeah. It would be similar to um, Mark having been a, a, a mechanic, somebody who can work on engine motors and obtained all these levels of mechanic certifications that not only would reach you into higher pay levels, which it wasn't a pay level thing in the C organization. It was more of personal achievement and higher training and knowledge yeah. of the inner workings of Scientology. So Dave, that was one of the tools that he would use to help crush you. He There was no factual evidence to, to prove that Mark was no longer competent at performing those tasks. He publicly uh, tore you apart in a public forum as not only to set uh, to, uh, to punch you in the face, but also set an example to those that are reading the issue that if, right. if you do what Mark did, you're also stand a chance of losing. Yeah. LRH called heart. it a head on a pike. Yeah, learn uh, to lose all your hard-earned work right. for certificates in, in Scientology. So that really meant a lot to a person, and I'm sure it meant a lot to you at the it time. It crushed me. And then, and then of course, I, and I was getting security checked and all that during this time, trying yeah. to salvage me and all, right? But then, you know, comes the, the uh, where, where Miscavige actually physically assaulted me in the garage. You're down the garage. And, and I remember and, that day because I was yeah. there for that day. Yeah, and I, I stood there and watched the garage, that happen. I don't, I don't remember, but I think you were in the garage when that. I happened. was just I, standing outside that that where the you know where the door yeah. slid open to the right yeah. of the man door. Mm -hmm. um, there was the where you normally you'd walk in through, and then you can go inside and roll the door open and drive a bus in. Yeah, uh, that was open, and you were inside, yeah. and Dave and his entourage, Shelley. Uh, Shelley yeah, well, was certainly was, there. I re what I remember was Steve Perrin. It was Mark Ingber, not Mark Yeager, who right. later came no, out. Ingber, saying, oh, I, I do was remember there, Ingber. Steve Perrin, Mark Yeager. Or sorry, Mark Ingber, uh, Andre was there, and because uh, they were doing it, you know, we were renovating the garage at that time, and doing I was finishing up on a touches on it. Lift. Yeah. I was up on a scissors lift painting yep. the pipes. They were color coding the pipes, and I was up there, and I was up there talking to down to. It. He asked me. He says, "I hey, do you? I, I hear you don't want to. You don't. Do you still want to leave the Sea Org?" And I said, "Yes." And then he said, "And I remember him looking up to you too. You yeah, know, just that profile yep, and the daylight exactly lighting right. him." I was 30 feet Everybody up in the air. Everybody was looking up to you, yeah. And, uh, he and you said, did have a bit of a cocky response, just a well, demeanor response. I was response. just going to say, for the first time in my life, I actually talked back to him. I'd I know. I'd never done it before. See, and I, I said, remember that. <laughs> yeah, and I said, I said, yeah, I want to leave. And he goes, you do? Why? And I said, freedom. And he yeah. said, you're a bypass case. And I said to him, no, you're a bypass case because you don't understand what I'm talking about. I'm talking about freedom to live my life the way I want to live it. Right. At which point he ordered me down off of the scissors lift. So I came down the scissors lift. And as soon as I hit the floor, he rushed across and grabbed me and said, you want to destroy Scientology or words to that effect. Yeah. And I, my intention was this guy's nuts. So I wasn't going to fight him back because there were people around. So I just went limp and covered up and went down on the ground and he kicked and pulled and, and yeah, I remember your you had glasses on because they went flying across across the floor too. I remember yeah, that. Yeah, I had like safety goggles or something yeah. on. Anyway, um so he, he, he And was I was in it. shock. And I waited till he finished up and he punched me out. I was on the ground covered up. And I stood up and I pointed my finger at him. I looked him right in the eye and I said, You notice I didn't lay one hand on you. And I wanted everybody to see that he was a nut, you know. Yeah. And so, and he said, oh, well, it's for your own good. And then I reached behind my head because I was felt blood. something warm. I pulled it out and I was blood. I said, you made my head bleed. Again, I wanted everybody to see that he was yeah. a nut. Okay? I remember that. Yep. And then he said, oh, well, it was for your own good. And I'll get the medical officer down here, blah, 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 blah. And then he scurried off. And, yeah. Uh, and then Shelly came up to me and uh, she said, get him a tissue and please Please, I mean, she. I, I distinctly remember she said, "Please make sure Mark gets taken care of." Yeah, I'd never seen him. I, look, I saw him lunge at Jason Benick years before in in our office. Lunge, literally, and Shelley and I were both like, "Dave, don't do that, Dave!" And we pulled him back. Right? I'd never seen him physically hit anybody. Now it's the first time. And I, well, I, and that, that for point, me was my first time of witnessing his physical 
uh, yeah. attacking you. And I went, I, this is not Scientology. No. I'm not sticking around for this. This is crazy. So between that and my certificates being canceled, we go to my second escape in August of 1990. I was working on the sports fields. We were trying to get the sports fields ready for Sea Org Day. And we were also renovating the G units, which were the uh, the units out, the, the like bungalows for Tom Cruise to stay in with Nicole Kidman and for all any that. Any celebrities right? visiting the base. Yeah, that was Celebrities their visiting the base. And this occurred, okay? And yeah. we don't have to go into the tremendous details. You've told the story on another channel. But basically, there was a flash flood, like a 100-year flash flood. Right. And all this mud and sludge and rain and water and boulders came rolling down the mountains right across highway 79 into those g units and onto the sports fields and, and that picture uh, there just so folks know is truly yeah. another section just up the road from the g's like probably yeah. a mile yeah um, and i just i just grabbed this just yeah. to illustrate that there was a god it would be great to see mud if we had and a picture we're lucky of the g's. nobody got killed right yeah anyway that night miscavige called an all-base muster down in the in the dining area and we all had to stand at attention, all the gold staff up front. And he came walking in in his uniform, and he was like a rabid dog. I'd never seen him. I'd seen him upset. I'd never seen him that upset. And he was yelling about how it was all gold's fault. You guys weren't prepared. And it was a it was an act of God. Okay, I could use a more descriptive term. Yeah, but this was an act of God. And like you guys are scum, and you guys are this, and you're staying up until the G's are cleaned and yada 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 and i'm thinking to myself i'm out of here okay so i just i want to add some highlight yeah. to this little yeah. event mark and that yeah to our listening public imagine um imagine your boss for your whatever you do for a living or your your governor or somebody in, in a high up position coming and con suddenly berating you as an individual or as a group of people as responsible for the results of a natural act occurring, such as like a tornado coming through, right. destroying buildings and anything and everything that goes with it, you then are called to, you are summoned to everybody uh, come down to this town hall and meet here so you can get a rundown of what happened, thinking you're going into an informative state or situation only to then be completely verbally uh, decimated as a degraded individual and a group um, for at least a good solid half hour with no breaks in the communication. Uh, uh, and in this case, this is a church executive, so there was a lot more meaning behind to those that were taking this. And I just want to paint that picture because this was a defining moment of major change at the Imp base major and for change. Dave Miscavige as an individual and how he dealt with situations. But he made a whole organization somehow believe that they were, they were the cause and the ones responsible for that flash flood, this act of God, this act of nature, this natural incident occurring to occur and then take out in in i mean there was really wasn't much property damage to be honest no. with you when you look back at it but it was it just the, the fact that it happened and it blocked the roadway and took out some of my perimeter fence but the biggest thing was is that mud touched the building that he has worked so hard at establishing to be tom cruise's temporary residence at the base while he was there getting his auditing and it was dave just unleashed like and, and just, let me vicious. add real quickly he unleashed in the most profane way yeah. that anybody, if, if you imagine the Pope or the head of a corporation talking worse than a sailor, yes. that's how he was talking. Yes. And sailors do it with some comedic value. Um, Dave did it with complete demeanor, demeanizing effort and intent. Just incredible. So yes. Well, anyway, so Sorry. I, I, thought he's nuts and, and it, lo and behold standing next to me uh was paul grady we didn't even talk to each other but he was standing next to me because he was in the states too and we found out later that we were both thinking the same thing this guy's crazy we're out yeah. of here you know so that night i uh, you guys had given me back my car keys okay and so i because i had ingratiated myself to the 
point where uh, yeah. security gave me my car back. You and worked yourself that. back up to trust, basically. Right, right. right. So, and, and I got to be honest with you. I was I was playing a game because I, you know, yeah. you, know, you got to try to get You were that, messing but, with me and you, I had no idea. I understand, Mark. It's yeah, okay. Yeah, anyway, so I had my keys to my car. Well, the, the order was everybody was to stay up until the mud and everything was cleaned up. Well, I went, well, I got to be sessionable. I'm being sec checked by RTC. I remember so I that. need to go home. So I got my car and I drove to our apartment, okay, in town. And again, I grabbed some stuff and then I took off again, this time heading to Los Angeles, okay? Hmm. And I drove and I went, stayed in a Holiday Inn in, in near Calabasas, California one night. I woke up the next morning. The whole time I was internally tearing myself apart. I got to go. I'm cr I'm going to go crazy if I stay, but I love my wife. I don't want to lose my wife. I've got all my friends there, you know, all this internal stuff. And I was a, I literally was a basket case. Yeah. So I went that next morning, I went to my sister's house. Okay. Now my sister uh, was a public Scientologist and this is her and her husband. Okay. And they lived in the Hollywood Hills and they were public Scientologists. They'd never been on staff. Right. So I went to her house, okay, and I showed up at the door, and I, she could see I was completely distraught and wiped out. And I said, Betsy, I said, I got to get some rest. I said, I, I'm, it's crazy. I can't tell you the details, but I cannot, I can't stay. I can't stay there anymore. And so she brought me into the house, and I went and I took a nap. And when I woke up, Mike Sutter and security guards were at the door to take me back to the base. Now, I don't know if you were involved in that at all, but do you recall anything like that happening or, or what, what Mike Sutter, or how they found out? Because I've always assumed that my sister contacted them or you guys contacted her or one or the other. Yeah, I mean, from your first blow, we already had our homework pretty much done as to who to contact, where to go. So I think the effort was easy. I I didn't have anything to do with that contact where, where you were with your sister. Probably um, Sutter and, and whoever he was dealing with. Yeah, Sutter and Osa uh, would have. I, you know, there since you were in L.A., um, they would have had PIs uh, sent over to put eyes on you, sit in the shadows, just so a set of eyes can be on you. So that would have been put in place right away. Um, I came in later when you came back up into the Hemet yeah. area and stayed locally, but never came back to the property itself. Well, well, that happened to be the last time I ever saw my sister or ever spoke with her. Yeah. Because the next time I blew, I was, uh, uh, she disconnected from me, but I never saw her again after that night uh, or, or that I never. Yeah, know, terrible. Yeah. I, and I didn't know about that. So that's. No, that's okay. I mean, look, yeah. I Jackson, I, I have no no animosity towards security oh. or anything yeah, like that at yeah. all, because you guys were doing your job and I understand yeah. that. Yeah. You know? Anyway, so that I went. That's what happened with my sister and her husband. So they met, Sutter made a big mistake. Okay, so when we got in the car, security drove my car back, and I drove in a car with Sutter. And uh, Mike Sutter told me he goes, "Oh, well, you weren't the only one who blew. Janice and Paul Grady blew last night too. You're, you know, last night too." And I had no idea. And I went immediately. Went, ding. Yeah. I am not crazy. Okay. Yeah. Because I'm not the only one who sees this. I have Janice and her husband, Paul, who, who was standing right next to me. And they had gone home that night, too, to the apartments and, and, and taken off as well. Packed their and shit and left. Janice's sister, Terry, and her husband, Fernando, they had left, you know, I don't know, five months before. Yep. So I'm thinking to myself, you know what? The next chance I get to get out of here, if I can't get my wife to go with me, I've got somebody somewhere that I can go to because, you know, they always tell you, oh, you'll be flipping burgers and yeah. McDonald's and all that shit. Right. Yeah. So I was like, OK, I'm not crazy. There's Paul and Janice Grady. There's Terry and Fernando Gamboa. And that was that was the next mistake that was made. Yeah. made me go, OK, now what? You know what I mean? Yeah. All of a sudden, all these people of strength and stature in Scientology yeah. Sea world started falling wayside. And I think Dave himself. Um, you know, to whatever it, however it hit him personally, I don't think that was the concern. How it hit him personally was the fact that these people were well aware of his crimes and his wrong and bad doings. And, uh, he started digging deep and utilizing the church resources, the church finances and the church resources 
to well, and what, I reala- what I realized was is that he wasn't playing by the same policies and rules that the rest of us were. No, he no, no, making no. Making it up. What he wasn't following L. Ron Hubbard policy. He was doing what the heck he wanted. Uh, oh, of I course, guess. and he just had this newfound power, especially at yeah. that time. And, and and I'll tell you the other part of it too. I still was a true believing Scientologist. I believed that L. Ron Hubbard and was coming back. Like he he had died and he was going to come back. I know Janice and Paul and a bunch of. We thought he was coming back, and I thought, you know what? He always sorts things out. So if I finally go and leave, I'll wait till he comes back, and then I'll come back, and it'll be sorted out. Right. I, that's how. That's how much of a believer I was. Well, and we all were goodwilled. You know, as you're sitting yeah. there, sure I'll come back. I'm trying to figure out how to make get myself set up to receive Mark and deal with this and make it a, a, a positive journey as best as possible. Um, none of us had any negative, anybody and everybody except for Dave was never concerned about a negative outcome. We were all looking for the positive. We need to help Mark make him make Mark a better Mark. And, uh, you know, I used to be shocked that we never admitted to any of our wrongdoings except uh, when you were delivered a communication indirectly by your case supervisor that it was discovered that there was some out technical procedure that you were addressed with and thus resulting in your poor mental state, thus leading to your blow. So we're here to fix that now. That's about as far as they would, the group would ever go in acknowledging their wrongdoing. Right. Just to pet your soul, just to make you feel, wow, that makes a lot of sense and God, I'm going to truly get this handled and and you know, kick the door open for you mentally to come back and go, yeah, I'm willing to have that addressed. Yeah. And thank you for taking the time to be so concerned about my well-being. You know, that was part of the tricks of the tools to get people lured back into the fold and put on to their what is it, uh, uh, reconditioning? What is that? What do they call the? What is what re-education, is that? Re-education. Yeah, re-education. You know, fix you up make you feel good and fuzzy and warm inside and reestablish you back onto that fixed stare down. I'm here for Scientology's future. Yeah. Um, yeah. And put yeah. you back on track and back in, back into work. Okay. And so now I'm back at the base the second time. This Mark, is I, I, I did want to inject here really quick, just cause I mm-hmm. noticed it, we're an hour and 17 minutes in and we haven't yeah. answered one question of well i know i'm, I'm okay. getting to the end okay. of it okay okay, okay I mean, no. that was the purpose of this was to tell the story and then sure. we'll answer questions okay right on brother. but anyway so now i'm back at the base okay now you guys have taken my car and i have a security guard watching me 24 7. i'm staying at the old gilman house in the security birthing there i everywhere i go whether i go to the bathroom or whatever there's a security guard with me yeah okay and I'll never forget, Kevin Katana was assigned to me to watch me. And he was my brother-in-law, which was kind of stupid. But um, again, I was working by myself in the garage, painting pipes. And, you know, I, the radio was on and he'd come over and turn it off. And I'd go over. I was being belligerent at that point. I would go over and turn it back on. And then he'd go over and turn it off. So then I, I took the radio and went up on the scissors lift and turned it on up there. You know yeah, I mean? no, I remember. I remember <laughs> yeah. this. And then, then another one you may remember is I can't remember the, the guard's name exactly, but basically I needed to go to the bathroom at MCI. And so I started walking. He said, no, you can't leave. You got to keep working. I said, no, I'm going to the bathroom. And he grabbed my, he grabbed my uh, shirt, right? And he ripped my buttons. He ripped my buttons on my shirt. So I grabbed his security shirt and I ripped his buttons down, right? And so then he grabbed me and I had a fanny pack with some stuff in and I hit him with my fanny pack until he let go. And then I went ahead and went to the uh, to MCI. Do you remember ever hearing a story? I almost want to say, you know, I do remember that happening. I want to say it was Jay Griffin. Um, no, it wasn't big guy. It was a short guy with brown hair, like brown, you know, blackish brown hair. Really nice guy. Like I, you know, I, not I didn't, not Danny Dunnigan. No, it wasn't Danny Dunnigan. I remember him, but Kenny uh, Kenny Siebold. I mean, not like Kenny Siebold. Brian, Kenny, Tom, I mean, I, I don't remember Kenny Campbellman. There was Ron Cook. No, none of those guys. But anyway, that, okay. so I was basically not cooperating. I was being a yeah. dick, right? Yeah, started and, exercising uh, because, that little freedom. Yeah, and, and you know, one time I tried, I walked to OGH, and the security guard walked me down the road because he thought I was leaving. I said, no, I'm just going to the dorm, you know, because I, I didn't care at that point. Yeah. And uh, it was shortly thereafter that, you know, I saw Julie, and Julie wouldn't speak to me. And uh, But I, I started playing the game again because I was thinking the first chance I get, I'm going to get out of here, right? And it was on my birthday, August 29th, that uh, 
she didn't even wish me happy birthday, nothing. And I, I finally realized that she was completely turned against me. I had not left, uh, you know, we'd never had a fight in six years. And all of a sudden she just would not have anything to do with me. So I went, okay, I got to get out of here. And then, so this was my third and final escape and we'll go through this real quick. Okay. So this is building 36, right? Which is out of the gold the base. Manufacturer. That, that's basically the building in which occupied golden era as an organization. Right. Golden and era it, was, productions. it was where the manufacturing was at the time. It was where the gold executive offices, uh, HCO security Sales. all had offices there. Right. Yep. Anyway, what happened was, this is September, again, September 14th or whatever. When they built this building, there were these tall oak trees that were next to it on the side. I know you're going to know exactly what I'm talking about. And when they built the building, they had, they had layered up the ground higher to, to support the foundation. And they left these, build, these, these large trees with donuts around them about six to eight feet deep all the way around them and they basically were suffocating the trees suffocated the eucalyptus from trees the dirt, over there yeah with the eucalyptus whatever they were but from the dirt the dirt was too too much on top of the roots so the trees were dying so miscavige ordered that gold was to stay up all night until they had dug out these trees right right and uh again so then i went here's my chance right so I have to be sessionable so i take the bus out to these and we had a funeral for that tree too by the way <laughs> we did an official funeral, but go ahead. This was the apartments we were staying at. At this point, I had gotten an approval and Julie and I were living in the staff birthing out there, but I didn't have my car um, out by the Hemet Airport in Hemet, California. Yep. And so I went out there. The next morning I woke up, I missed the bus on purpose. Now there was a, a mission in gold at the time that if you were late or whatever, you did the RPF and all. Uh, anyway, I don't need to go into that, but I missed the bus on purpose. And then I ran across this field between the apartments and a machine shop, which is right here. I went in the machine shop and I had my wallet, I had my credit cards. I called a taxi and I waited. And once the taxi got me, I went and checked into a motel in Hemet. And as soon as I got to the motel in Hemet, I called Mike Sutter. Okay. Yep, and I called the security easy. booth and I said, you guys either give me my shit or I'm going to the hem I'm going to the police and I'm showing up at the front gate. You give me back my car and all my stuff or I'm going to the cops. And I immediately got that. Oh, no, 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 no. We don't want that to happen. Yeah. Right? So Mike Sutter called me back and he talked me into coming back to the base. He said, we'll let you go. We'll let you have your car. We'll let you do all the stuff. But you got to come back to the base because you got to sort out your stuff with Julie and all that. And I said, well, if I come back, how do I know you're not just going to grab me and keep me? And he, he right. said, no, have the taxi wait for you up at the guard, guard booth at Building 36 and we'll take care of your work, you know, take care of everything. And then you can go with your car. So that's what I did. I went back to the base and uh, I, I pulled up and I went into the HCO office and you were in there with Julie, correct? I think so. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it was you and Sutter and Julie. Yeah. And I, I said, look, Julie, I'm going to write you a check right now. We had yeah, I think $7,000 in the bank. And I said, I'm writing you a check for $8,500 right now. There's half the money. Okay. I said, you can keep our furniture and all of our possessions. All I want is the car. And she goes, I want the car. And I said, Julie, you've got $8,500. We paid 7,000. Go buy another car. Yeah. Okay? Uh, I was I was done. I had had it right. And Julie asked me, you know, why do you want to leave? And I made up an excuse that she could accept. I said, look, I want to leave and have a family and kids. I didn't tell her about, you know, all the crap that was going on. Right. Right. And so then I signed the paper. You know, I did that. You guys at that point, there were no way, you know, no, you know, bonds or anything right. like that. No, like you will never say anything about you. nothing. I mean, literally, this was the infancy of people. So I didn't have to sign shit. OK. And then I went with you and we went out to, I think it was you, we went out to the storage unit out of Kirby where our stuff had been stored. And then we went through the storage uh, closet and you took anything that had Sea Org memorabilia. Yeah, you know, anything or, connected with the base whatsoever. All photographs, because I had photographs. I wish I had them because I had photographs of DM holding guns and all sorts of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? yeah. And I managed to sneak out the that one issue where he canceled my uh, my stuff. And then I was gone. That was it. Um, and so I wanted to ask you, so what happened with Julie? 
my wife because at that point I was upset, but. I knew she wasn't really with me. So what what happened from that end of things? If you well, recall? she basically uh, she, she went about her business. Uh, I'm sure she got a lot of behind the scenes. She got counseling uh, and stuff like that. But she wasn't under sp- specified watch your guard. Do you remember um, what she her reaction was? Did she say anything? Well, it, she never shed a tear. I, yeah. I know she didn't. Julie had a very uh, quiet demeanor about her mm-hmm. and um, you know, it, it was like she was really good on, on holding back tears, but you can see she was sad, but she was very loyal at the same time. So she had no reason herself to leave. Um, that's about and what and I she remember. Was like Shelly, she was like Shelly. She'd been on the ship on the Apollo yeah, since she, she was like 13 years old working as Hubbard's messenger. And so she was dedicated to Hubbard, you know. Very deep loyalty to the sea yeah. organization itself. So, yes. Um, yeah. she's, she even wrote some of the original flag orders. I, I You know, as I understood that she yeah, wrote the one, one on the 2D rules. <laughs> and the very next week she herself went out 2D, violating the very flag order that she wrote. But that's just what I heard. Um <laughs> Uh, nonetheless, uh, I mean, Julie, she she wasn't taken off for whatever job she had found. I think she was working in estates or some tape area or something. Yeah, she was in estates, yeah. Yeah, and um, she was just kept an eye on, and uh, I'm sure other people met with her on and off. I had to keep reporting on her and check on her daily. So that's that was basically became her life. She wasn't showing any signs of, fuck this, I'm out of here, I'm leaving with Mark. Um, now, you told me years later, which I never knew, was yeah. that maybe a month or so afterwards i left september 15th 1990 she actually blew with with a landscape guy yeah right? now over the course of her working out on the and again this is at the time when the base itself the property was being improved upgrades were being done the new sports field was being put a new irrigation to the south side was being established a new deep well pump new painting new and it's just all sorts of millions sports of dollars fields. the whole sports new sewage fields, system yeah. was being put in yeah. new electrical system all the above ground wires were being put underground it was a tremendous thing julie herself was in charge of an aspect of the sports field where the soccer fields are that you see these aerial photographs are where the softball field is soccer field and the park course was out there um volleyball courts all that julie worked with hired contractors there was a there was a specific irrigation contractor that they basically as human beings started flirting with each other and um of course julie was out there in her very short short tight shorts every day um she had legs that went on forever and she's a very good looking gal and this guy fell favorite to her and they were bat and eyes nobody initially picked up on this developed over a few weeks maybe a month um but julie i definitely had a guard watching her out at at birthing she lived at kirby gardens out there at kirby uh off of kirby avenue in in uh west hemet mm-hmm. um hemet california which is where we had off base uh, apartment complex for the staff to live and um kenny siebold was particularly on watch one night and up to this point, there was a suspicion that Julie had eyes for this guy and something may happen. And the night that this went down, I was on the phone with Mike Sutter. He was giving me an update on what had been discovered in Julie's counseling about what her intentions were with this guy. So they were trying to verify by meter, the Hubbard electrometer, to, to, to get around Julie's <coughs> suspected lies that she had no intentions for this guy. But, you know... The physical indications were there. She just kept wagging her tail, and he kept responding. So uh, I'm on the phone with Mike Sutter. I, I also had a radio contact with Kenny Siebold. You need to attend to your puppy dog? No, I'm okay. Okay, she's doing her job. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I literally am on the phone with Sutter, and then uh, Kenny Siebold was on, because I had to set up this repeater so it strengthened our signals that I can communicate from the basement of building 36 basically from underground and talk all the way out to him which was like a 15 20 minute drive Mm -hmm. so i I had a well-established radio system and i'm sitting there and kenny suddenly comes on with michael sutter uh, hearing this over the phone that 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 this contractor pulled up in front of the, the the kirby gardens julie comes running out 
through the gate and jobs hops right in his truck and he's got like a lifted chevy pickup truck i just remember i had mud tires on it was lifted but she literally just boom, boinged right in that truck he kind of had the door open for her so this was pre-planned pre pre-planned by the two so off they go and i had kenny set up in a car he then began in mike sutter's like you better not let her fucking blow you know don't fuck him he just started cussing up a storm and suddenly I'm his lifeline to the whereabouts of Julie because if I can't see her, Mike's going to get in trouble. So this whole intensified scenario kicks in. And this is the first for me. Um, I had a high-speed chase for hours. This lasted for, I think it started around 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night, Mark, that this, this took place and suddenly I had to formulate, put together this plan of obtaining cars, chase cars, to follow her. Cars that... Uh, I had no no pre-plans were put into place that were fueled up. Who am I going to have? Um, staff were just beginning to leave for the night there. I commandeered like a police officer would stop somebody in, in the road and go, this is FBI, we need your vehicle, get out. You know, you've seen those in the movies. Uh -huh. The exact same thing I did on Abby Ambron, <clears throat> who had a Mazda RX-7 uh -huh. at the time. And Abby, you know, he was already gone through. So he was one of my deputized guards that I could use at times. So he was more than excited to kick his own wife out of the car. And I signed a guard to go running with Abby. So I had two cars and Kenny Siebold's car, three cars now chasing Julie with this uh, wow. outside contractor. And they came back northbound. We thought they were coming back to the base, but they came northbound and continued up Lambs Canyon towards Beaumont, California. And I picked right up on them and um, somehow managed to manage this chase. We got under the 10 freeway. We headed towards San Bernardino. And, I f and this was going 60, 70, 80 miles an hour. And when he realized how many cars were following him and he couldn't shake us, he was trying to shake us. And it literally, uh, no, I'm not glorifying or... or polishing this in any way this was a true high-speed chase he would yeah. he would be uh using trucks on the freeway that he would parallel along and then when an off-ramp would come up he would shoot off the freeway and i i uh was kind of predicting all of his maneuvers and would strategize our cars you be here you be there as we're going this even so much so that i was able to refuel our cars by leapfrogging ourselves having one car go ahead knowing the geographic layout you go to that gas station up in yukaipa you better hurry up and get fuel and get back on the freeway somehow i managed this plan as it was unfolding and um we went through riverside county san bernardino county la county throughout that night um wow. and uh mm -hmm. i remember going up around Patton state hospital which was kind of notorious inside because that's where a famous psychiatrist was. What's his name? Um, anyways, historically in Scientology, his name was Jolly something, Jolly West. Oh, I, I remember uh, Jolly West. Yeah, yeah. So I just remember it's like, man, I'm in Jolly West's home, you know, stomping grounds. But it was all at night. Anyways, this was high speed chase that, uh, uh, like, power slides, smoke. And him going off road, and us going off road, and chasing him, bumping around, and just was intense. Uh, for I'm um, oh gosh, we lost, we we chased him till just before sunlight. So that would wow. have been uh, five thirty, six o'clock in the morning. And um, my orders were we could not lose him. So that was my compulsion and my crew, my staff's compulsion to not lose him. Well, this guy eventually smartened up and realized that I could go off road because his vehicle was a lifted Chevy pickup truck with, you know, shocks and ground clearance to go off road. So he, you know, we went through, like I said, all those counties through Riverside, San Bernardino, Los Angeles. We went as far into Los Angeles um, to Boyle Heights area and then circled back into San Bernardino off the 10. Uh, we went down into Pomona, near the Pomona fairgrounds. Um, anyways, these are all geographics that I'm like, man, we are covering some ground. And somehow I managed to stick up, stay up with them. And 
And he shook us off going by going off road up by state Patton state hospital again in San Bernardino. And that's where Abby and his RX Mazda RX seven tried to go off road and some rocks broke one of his axles on his car. And we ended up having to pay oh for it. God. Yeah. And, um, that was a true genuine high speed chase. I couldn't believe it, but I thought, you know, how cool is this? And that I was able to keep up and doing, and then eventually, um, uh, I'm going to say by 10 o'clock, because we lost them then, by 10 o'clock in that morning, we found out where they were, and they settled down in a hotel in Redlands, California, where they did the dippity dip, which was the goal that Dave, I remember Dave yelling Heron in the background while Mike was on the phone, he better not fuck her, and that was Dave's concern, was that this guy would fuck Julie, and um, by default... And that was strange to me hearing that, that that's what was about to happen. And that's basically my motivated defense of what I was trying to avoid happening. And I uh, can't avoid two, uh, two people shacking up in a motel. And that's where we found them. And yeah, it all it all happened. And well, how did you get them back? Kevin, when we found him in, at that hotel, Kevin was used as... Her brother? Yep, talking her off the ledge basically to get her come back. And she came back. And then you guys rounded her up from the motel and took her back to the base? Yeah, no, it was once we found her, it was easy peasy. I mean, Kevin spent a couple hours convincing her to come back, and she hopped in the car with him and came back, and to my knowledge, never saw that guy again. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, I, it was um, pretty significant. Let me ask you a question. How did you, how do you feel? I mean, look, I, ha I have no animosity towards any of the stuff you guys did, but how do you, how do you feel? now that you've been out for so long that you basically rounded her up or rounded people up. What, how did you feel about that? Disgusting. Um, disgusting. I mean, what, what am I doing chasing somebody with the sole reason of th there wasn't any purpose being served except to satisfy Dave Miscavige. Uh -huh. That's, that's my motivation. That's who I felt I was satisfying by continuing to do what I was doing. It wasn't, Julie needs help and this poor soul is out here just genuinely needing our help. So we're chasing her because she needs our help. She just is not aware of it yet. This was satisfying the orders and direction from Dave for Dave Miscavige himself. And that was my compulsion. And, and by that initial fail of losing her off road, I felt that I was going to get in trouble. Right. But I didn't. Um, because we kept on keeping on and we surrounded the area and we couldn't figure out where they're going to come out and yada, yada, yada. But then we eventually found her at that hotel. Yeah, and, from, and, and from my end of things, you told me this story years after we, after you left or whatever. I mean, it would have been great because we probably would have, you know, reconnected. We hadn't gotten divorced at that point. No. And, uh, and we would have somehow reconnected. But I, like I said, I don't hold any animosity. I believe things happen for a reason you know yeah i personally uh, think julie herself was a lost soul and she was just swimming around in her own loss of you and the yeah. loss of her position and doing something she didn't want to do and then suddenly there's another man in her life interested in her and and that was her escape yeah and then the the, the one thing that you know she years later when they i i spoke out in the truth rundown series at the in the st petersburg times you know, she put out a, 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 a they not she Scientology put out something from her, and basically the only thing she said that me that it was true that was bad because she didn't really trash me was that I went to her family because I told her in your office when I was with you, she said please don't go to my family because she didn't want me yeah. to go to your family, and I said I wouldn't and I would I meant it, but when I was on the road after I left, Change I had mind. nowhere to go, so right. I ended up going to her father and her stepmother. They showed up in their door and they welcomed me with open arms, you know, yeah. and they helped me for like the first month or two. So I, I understand how that upset her because, you know, like I said, I said I wouldn't do it, but I went ahead and did it. You know? Yeah. And unfortunately, Julie is still at that base to this very day. Yeah. She, somebody asked where, where she's still there. Yes. Yeah, she's she still remarried there. Peter Schles. She married Peter Schles. Yeah. He's a golden era musician. He's famous for having written, co-written the song the in the 1980s, On the Wings of Love. Yeah. If anybody doesn't know that song, it's On the Wings of Love. Anyway, um, and he's still there, stuck in there, and uh, he's been in the hole from what I understand, and I have no idea what Julie's been up to since then, but she's still yeah. in there. Yep. Anyway, that's the story, and then we'll get to your questions here, but I just wanted to show one last photograph here. That's me in October 1990. 
right after I left, I went and I had money. I went to Hawaii for 10 days and that's me in freedom in Hawaii in, in 1990. I went on vacation. And then when I came back to San Diego or to her father's house, to Julie's father's house, phone rang, picked it up and it was Janice Grady looking for me. And the rest is history. So beautiful. Yeah. I mean, lucky yeah, you. Because I used connected. to sit back at the base secretly trying to figure out how to get a hold of Terry and Janice, quite yeah. honestly, with you. Yeah. And this is before cell phones or the internet, people. This was uh, yellow pages and white pages. Yeah. And, you know, but anyway, so the rest is history. Janice is my co host, and we've been friends for all this time. And, uh, and that's that. So, anyway, we're going to, I know it's been a long story, and I didn't mean to take it that long, but. I hope you guys, I know that we got 274 people in here right now, and uh, I know you've been very patient with your questions and all that. If you do have questions, put them in the chat. We love super chats and super stickers, and we're going to go to your questions right now. And don't forget, subscribe to uh, Jackson's channel and subscribe to my channel. Uh, the, the links are in there. I know Goldie's been putting them up there as well, and we'll answer some questions. Okay, Jackson? Yeah, I do want to answer one, which I can't find right away. Somebody from Australia, I believe, was asking about whether we carried bazookas at the base as part of security <laughs> forces arsenal. We never did, never no. saw one. No. I'm not sure where that information comes from, but uh, to my knowledge, up until 97 when I left, security or Scientology did not possess any form or type of bazooka. <laughs> well, and then Maybe you've a, been asked, you've been asked if they have guns and security. You guys had guns in the, in yes. the guard. The guard uh, we definitely uh, possess firearms and we were trained, you know, you know, we were in-house trained. But that, they weren't trained. the only firearms at the base. Miscavige had, no. had his own personal arsenal. Yeah, he um, had himself. Norman Stark, he had his own. Ray Midoff. Yeah. All executives had their own. Yeah, a lot of had, staff had their own guns. I, yeah. I, I would have gotten them, but I'm not a, I'm not anti-gun, but yeah. Julie didn't want them, so we didn't ever have them. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, they were all no. intended to be recreational that I knew of, and that's yeah. how they were used. Yeah. Even Norman Stockley had this elephant gun that... I know that my one. My God, that thing was loud, and... He shot that thing when he first got it up at the, the rifle range up at Bonneview, and Mark Yeager was up there, and DM, and of course, and I was up there. Anyway, it, the, the bullet looked like a like the Saturn V rocket. It yeah, was so big. it was incredible. And uh, they shot at uh, some Clorox bottles up on the mountainside. And Jaeger, when he shot it, the recoil, he the, had a scope on it. The yeah. recoil, the scope hit him in his forehead and cut his forehead. Drew blood. Yeah, I remember that day. Yeah. All right, let's get some questions here. First one here, Super Chat. Thank you so much, J.R. Exner. Join the fight against xenophobia. Yeah, xenophobia. So we're all here for <laughs> Thanks for Xenophobia. Yeah, that's funny. First I heard we of that. We appreciate it. Okay, here's the next one here. Another Super Chat. Uh, this is from Amanda Mangles. Thank you so much, Amanda. We appreciate it. Gary, love seeing you. You always are so humble and love hearing your stories and love seeing you here on March Channel. Gary, you need a new video. <laughs> and I do. And thank you so much, Amanda. I will definitely produce another one. Yeah. Yeah, Jackson's great. Uh, by the way, like I said, no animosity whatsoever. I mean, how could you not love Jackson? Everybody loves Jackson. <laughs> even, when, even when he was doing something security-wise, he was a great guy. You know what I mean? He no was doing his job, but he didn't make you feel like you were trash. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks very much for that one. All right, here's the next question. Bach Buddy, question Jackson. What did the very little dictator have to do with the pictures or anything else you were told to confiscate from leaving the imp base execs? Uh, destroy out of spite or save for leverage? Okay, so... A little dictator to have me do with the pictures that I collected or any other personal items uh, from people's personal belongings with anybody that was leaving the base or had left the base. All of those items, um, photographs, relics, Sea Org relics such as tie pins, something that had uh, reference to Scientology or synchronization or a gift. You know, over the years, people were given calculators or uh, travel cases. With towels, Seorg sim towels, towels. with Seorg symbols on them. Yeah, all those could not be taken. The people could no longer have them, even though they were given to them as a gift, because if they had direct ties to the Seorg or, or the it base, um, they were just collected and information uh, pulled and documented as we found them from them. Like if we found they had a phone list in them, uh, like a base phone list, which was you know published at times. Um, you know, we would draw inches as to why are you taking the base phone lifts with you? Uh, other than that, it was just 
if the pictures that they possessed, we would go through them and had any reference to any other base staff member, any other Sea Org member that was on there, we would just pull them. Unless it was them in a tree or them petting a dog or their their own dog. It couldn't even be a picture of them and another base staff member's dog. It had to be just them and their dog. And the background in the picture would give no reference as to where that picture was being taken. You know, that's the details in which we looked and we just collected it and put it in a bag and forward it to RTC. And uh, whatever they found fit with it, we either have it returned or it would be kept for keeping somewhere in, in storage. That's well, I'll tell you one thing that was taken from me and it wasn't taken by you. It was, I think it was taken by Sutter or whatever. I had a solid gold RTC ring that yep, were made for all the RTC staff. It had the RTC, it was like a signet ring and it had the symbol of RTC in it. And uh, I, and it would cost like 600 bucks. It was a beautiful ring. And uh, I had to give that back. Now, the thing is, is that I paid for that ring. Yeah. Uh, you know, we got it, we got them, but they took it out of our bonus money that we had been paid, you know, years before. So literally they took, they took the ring and the gold value and stuff like that. I didn't yeah. really care about the ring, but Hey, they could have given me some money. Cause I got, I didn't get anything. Yeah. And then in the church, it's funny that you mentioned it that way, Mark, because they didn't care. You paid for it to get it in the first place, but you know, it was their offering offering initially as an acknowledgement to either some historical moment in Scientology or your longevity in, in the C organization itself. And if you wanted uh, this gold pin, but have a diamond to it, you had to pay for that diamond. And even if you paid for it, when it came to you leaving, they just took it back. You didn't get reimbursed for it. it back, no. Legally, you owned it. But they, again, that was the internal, you know, you're on our property. You're in within our fence. Yeah. We own you. You want to leave, you got to hand it over. Listen, we're going to answer more questions here, but I just want to let you know, you notice Bach Buddy wrote question before his comment. If you please do that, it makes it easier for us to find them in Adam Jalis so we don't miss your questions. And we'll go to the next one here. This is from Mark Andrew Demarist. Where's Jackson's throat? Sultry voice. That man's got a million dollar voice. <laughs> well, Mark, uh, here it is for you. If you if this uh, is floating your boat or putting some wind in your sails, because uh, that's what I'm here for, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> okay great thanks mark we need a little here. <laughs> next one fyt 54 32 one question for jackson um were there any ever any trespassers caught entering the property if so what was their purpose and the outcome yes there were uh, a handful over the years of trespassers that would come there would be locals uh just to entertain themselves to see what we would do they would come out and screw with the golden era guards um they, they range from uh, early on, these kids came out dressed in ninja suits, literally head to toe with the ninja booties and everything. And all you could see is this little slit through the black clothing that they had. And, and they had these blunt uh, bamboo sword knives. And I sent one of my guards out to respond to the alarm that they set off and scared the living bejesus out of Jay Griffin, who was the guard. And he was freaked out. And I sent all my guards out there only to find these little punks messing with it. They were laughing their ass off. And I just let them go. Two uh, people would come out there and they would launch these tennis balls filled with um, gunpowder uh, wrapped in packing tape with a waterproof fuse on them. And they would sit out outside our fence. They would uh, have these balloon launches or wrist rockets and launch a rock to shake our fence to set the alarms off. We'd come in out there with us on a rover bike. And then they would light these bombs and launch them in and had to land around us and try to scare the crap out of us. Uh, some of them, the fuses would burn out and we'd throw them right back. Uh, it was, you know, we had these little bombs for a while. We never found out who those people were. We had people um, jump in the fence on the north side of the property. Uh, we had more high-speed chases following those people back into town. Uh, Gino DeChef was one of those. You probably... I've heard that story somewhere along the line, Mark. Yeah. Um, and JB, I think, was one. But um, there was just a handful over the entire years that I was there. So okay. uh, we they actually were always caught. We even had a high-speed chase from local law enforcement, uh, highway patrol, a Riverside County Sheriff chasing bank robbers that ended up wrecking on the main Highway 79 in front of the, the G units. They bailed out of their car, hopped our perimeter fence, and this is after my security system had already been um, designed, installed, and functioning. And we had the Ultra Barry on top of 
the fence, those spikes, it's called ultra barrier. And those bank robbers found their demise when they hopped the fence. Because they hopped the fence, got stabbed and poked by them, went running down into the sports field, which is where Kenny Siebold found them. And the guy was bleeding out from those. And he tried to climb back out of the fence and kept getting stabbed more. And he just gave up simply because of it. And the Riverside County Sheriff was so impressed by the effectiveness of our, they commended us for curtailing and catching a criminal. And we had cops everywhere, but that was just an example of an incident. Um, and funny thing enough is I got written up in the fire department because I was responding as a volunteer firefighter initially to that crash out in front of the G units, not knowing that they were bank robbers being chased by the police. So I was there in my churnouts safety gear responding to a, uh, an incident only to find that I need to throw my security responsibility hat back on and go drive around now in my firefighting turnouts and chase down intruders in my property. So I got written up by the fire department for doing that. And I could not defend myself because I couldn't throw the church under the bus. No. So I had to take one for the team and get disciplined back at the firehouse. It was an unfortunate, it was really sad. It ate me up inside. I could not tell my fire captain what I was doing and why I had to run around in my turnouts. Yeah. And as far as he's concerned, I was under his command at that incident. Anyways, it was very confusing. So there's my answer to that. Um, okay. Yeah. Thanks for the question. I'll tell more on my, on my channel as time goes on. So, yeah. Okay, great. Next question, Michelle R. Jackson, do you have siblings? If so, are you in touch with them? I do. I have an older sister and a younger sister, neither of which I'm in touch with. Um, Scientology disconnection policy full at full <laughs> play. Sorry. And that's been at play for since 2000 and I don't know, whenever this, the St. Petersburg Times articles came 2009. out. 2009. 2009. I haven't spoken to my sisters. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for your question. Next one, Super Chat. Thank you so much, J.R. Exner. As a security guard, how did you and LRH explain why anyone would bother to trespass in a church administration complex? We had lots of equipment there, very expensive equipment. Yeah, initially the property in L. Ron Hubbard's intention was to not have any fencing around the property. He wanted to have an open free space yeah. until um, there was this building called the Greenskeepers or Groundskeepers House which eventually became the peer of center of the running program building down on the south central side of the property that originally was being used as a recording studio for the musicians. And they had forty to $50,000 worth of equipment stolen one night. And again, this was back in uh, early 1982. Yeah, it was, it was a long time ago. Yeah, and uh, L. Ron Hubbard said, that's it, put a fence up. So a fence was put around that building. And then the just the really tight, small footprint of the main proper buildings up along the highway, uh, such as around MCI and those, those buildings and then on the north side. So out of the 525 acres, there was probably uh, uh, 75 acres of fencing put in initially. Barry was still low profile and some you know ironwork stuff to give it some appearance, but then eventually it was expanded to miles of fencing and serious approach to it. So from there, that initial incident, it grew and then eventually, uh, yeah. Um, how did you and LRH explain why anyone would bother to trespass in a church administration complex? Well, L. Ron Hubbard was never there. We always believed. And, you know, I do know, I found out later that he actually did come to that property when I was on watch. And I'll tell stories about that on my channel. And I'm not using that as a teaser to go to my channel, but <laughs> for save time here. Um, you know, it was for a number of years, we always have the mental state that L. Ron Hubbard you know, through all of our successful actions, one day we're going to kick that door open for him to come back and we're going to be proud to see members of the Imp base that we've afforded L. Ron Hubbard a safe home to now be in. So, yeah, uh, it's a very serious approach and attitude was addressed towards security. So that should hopefully answer that question. Okay, great. Thank you so much for that super chat, JR. All right, here's our next question. Question, Mark, did you have a code name like Jackson? No, that, no. that would have been... From, you're you that was a nickname more than a code name for you right uh well it was a nick it was an expression that i used to use that then became yeah. my security yeah. handle but yes yeah. um you know like, like like marcus swanson his original name was mark so right. you were yeah 
It was, and Mark, it was, Mark Rathbun was Marty because, you know, there was also other Marks. And all for that. some reason, it wasn't consistent to everybody having nicknames and security quote names, secondary names, but uh, a significant amount of people did. I got called I, by Miscavige and Shelley by my last name, Fisher, and I, yeah. I hated it. I hate, I mean, I, I hate being called by my last name. I find it very disrespectful. Yeah. And uh, when uh, years later, after I left the Sea Org, I, I was working at a company where my boss called me Fisher one time and I pulled him exactly. aside and I explained to him, I said, listen, don't you ever call me by my last name again? I said, it's nothing personal, but I just despise being called by my last name. And I don't, I don't. Amazing. It. And he said, oh, I'm sorry. I, I will never do that again, you know, but, uh, and it has to do with the fact that that's what they called me. So whenever anybody called me that I immediately almost PTSD would react to it you know same thing with that, beepers huh? I, can, I can never knew that i can totally see that happening and dave and doing it same thing with beepers like when i first got out you know you didn't have cell phones so some yeah. bosses wanted you to wear a beeper i hated wearing beepers even when they became digitized where you knew who you were calling um you know it just would set me off wow <laughs> wow okay all right next question here we go all right, this is from Luz Even. Question, Cheryl hi, gentlemen. Vegas. Carol in Las Vegas here. Is it possible to tell OSA and everyone something you've done today that makes you happy that they are not able to do? I'd love for them to hear. Something I've done today that that, uh, that would make them happy? I'm talking to my friend, Gary Jackson Moorhead, for one. And number <laughs> two, earlier today, I did a two-hour interview with Janice with uh, Ken Urquhart, who uh, used to be L. Ron Hubbard's butler and personal communicator. And we did part one is already out, but we recorded part two today. And you know something? I had a blast doing it. And I'm having a blast right now talking to all you people and to my friend Jackson. How about you, Jackson? Well, Cheryl, um, first of all, beautiful Vegas. My dad lives there, and I will soon be visiting there sometime. And I always get to see Mark and there. hang out with Janice. <laughs> but a non-Scientology, non-dirty past uh, relation. Um, today was a beautiful day here in Portland, Oregon. I enjoy the absolute gorgeous weather. I um, I have landscapers that came out just mostly because of time. I like to keep my yard in rose rose bushes dialed in and, and looking as best they can and cared for. So I uh, did some yard maintenance and um, I actually spoke to somebody uh, in support for the aftermath today too. Somebody calling in on that line. I spent time talking to this individual, helping them with a very traumatic, uh, they just wanted someone to talk to and get some help and get some direction. So I did that and hopefully they're here listening now, but, um, you know, that's pretty fun, right? Um, it's so nice. I, I wake up early, uh, because the premier league soccer season seems to come to an end. I usually am up by four to watch that and I make myself coffee. I'm just currently getting into, uh, uh, trying some gourmet shit like Tarantino says in Pulp Fiction. You know, I buy the <laughs> I buy the gourmet shit. <laughs> well, not yeah. So I try to indulge in that. Uh, toast up some bagels and raspberry jam from Costco and ease myself into a beautiful day and just go along as I choose. So there's my answer. Okay, great. Thank you so much, yeah. Love Seven. Next question, Love Food Kitchen. Uh, says, has anyone, Janice maybe got pictures of the original Bonnie View or MCI before it was torn down, et cetera, et cetera. I'd love to see what it was like before its Disneyfication. I can tell you, I've searched, I searched before this uh, interview on Google. I did find some old pictures of Gilman Hot Springs Resort before we even bought it, okay? Yeah. And I did find one picture of MCI when an old one with a golden era production sign in front of it. So I'll, I'll be happy to put those together. I was looking for a photograph of Bonnie view from before that. And I can't find any. How about you, Jackson? Uh, yeah. And you know what? All the pictures are up here because there was three different stages from my life at the base. There was the original Bonnie view. And then that was originally gutted and reinforced and it's jacked third. up. Remember that? We yeah, it was jacked up barrier underneath it. Uh, and uh, not mm -hmm. only protected from barrier uh, moisture and, and mold from Melo and Hubbard, but also yeah. reinforced for earthquake purposes. Yeah. And it was basically the same structure. And then his car garage was built at that time. And that's yeah. the way it remained until and the laundry it, and the laundry facility yeah. was built. And um, that is basically um, that building, what I knew back then, doesn't no longer exist. And what exists today is this grand, 
mansion is ridiculous. It's a ridiculous amount. Like, oh my God. What way. a way. There's over That's the top, the and then I don't know what you defined over beyond over yeah. the top, just grotesquely over the top. Yeah. And for somebody who's never coming back. So um, no pictures, unfortunately, and those that I did have all been taken, you know. Okay, thank you so much for the question. Next one. Ryan Mahaje, a question for Jackson. Nora mentioned that Scientology has an arsenal of weapons, trains its people, and is prepared to do whatever is necessary to protect his property. Can you elaborate and or confirm? We talked a little bit about that, but do you have anything you want to yeah, add? Yeah, and again, this is going to be my effort to um, squashing this generally understood thing that Scientology has an arsenal. You know, arsenal is open to interpretation. What we did have as church-owned uh, firearms were 45 caliber pistols and 12 gauge shotguns. And at one time we did own and possess high power rifles. They were H and K 91s, 308 calibers with bipods on them. So you could sit there and, uh, with the bipod and stabilize your, not your, your, your muzzle, your rifle and shoot them. Why we had those guns. I don't know. I think that was a Rick Asner thing initially back in the day. Cause Rich, Rick Asner was kind of a, uh, a uh, rebel, and if he was given money, he would take advantage to buy stuff like that. And then I eventually had those sold because the laws changed in California that you could not possess such guns. I sold those to some gentlemen in Texas, and that money that from that turned around and bought a high power sniper rifle, professional sniper rifle, um, at the direction of one of our PIs, private investigators, and um, put a high power. Uh, scope on it. it was very professionally set up and only certain people had access to it knew the codes knew how to access them and knew how to use them and we actually did train on using them and um responsibly handling them no one carried them except for two guards who got licensed to carry them for local pr purposes because we used to go out and help the local Hemet pd when they would call upon these two volunteer guards to go out there and help them do public service stuff so uh, there was never direction in all that to carry firearms and create this fire driven. In fact, there was an L. Ron Hubbard directory that we're not we're not interested in carrying guns and leaving dead bodies around. We're interested in putting ethics and technology in and bettering people through the use of Scientology. So there was even specific directives by L. Ron Hubbard to not carry guns. And we all knew that only in the event if the shit hit the fan that. Uh, we would all those certain guards would carry him and we'd use him to defend ourselves physically and short story i almost killed a gentleman because we were trained so much and uh there was a scenario that was presented to us one night up near the villas and i literally had a firearm a pistol 45 leveled safety off finger on the trigger counting in my head two to the chest one to the head and that's a story i will elaborate on when i uh, on my own channel but yes i i have to live with the fact that i literally was milliseconds away from pulling a trigger and killing another human being wow in defense of dave miscavige and the executives in the villas so now, i, I want to add to this because i happen to know when i was there uh, david miscavige's personal gun collection uh he had he had several he had he, he got given some as gifts at his birthday mm -hmm. he got a galil israeli assault rifle which he loved he had a mini 14 rifle he uh, got an AR-15 at one point. Uh, he had all sorts of handguns. He had uh, over and under shotgun, a Remington 12 gauge. Uh, and uh, when I was there, I don't know about later on, he had a loaded 38 in his desk drawer at all times. So I don't know if he still yeah. does or not. And I knew that. 38 revolver. It was yeah. in his desk drawer. Yeah. And he could get it if, if somebody came through the door, he could get it. So I guess with this little information that Mark and I told you, there would be this outside appearance that Armor, there was an armory at play. L. Ron Hubbard had a whole room dedicated yeah, but it's to not, guns. It's not against the law either. No, it's I not mean, against the law. Second Amendment rights and day, ninety day. percent of it was purely for entertainment purposes. Yeah, and we exactly. had a, and that was what it was for. I'm sure Dave. I, and in fact, I know because Shelley and I used to talk about it. That Dave had his own self protection up in this place, oh, and yeah. I, you know, and they were also secure because I also asked to make sure that they were stored properly and not just left lying loosely around. So. Yeah, the history of my involvement in security, there was attention and and all that with guns. So. Let me ask you a quick question, okay? I remember one time when Pat Broker, you know, when LRH was still alive, Pat yeah. Broker came to the base in the silver van. Yeah. And I he came running around the lower villa as I was walking around the middle of the villa and he had a, he had like an Uzi. 
and yeah. he was running to get into the silver van. Yeah, he showed up to the property with it. Something we couldn't control. That was so early No, he, on. Was, he was a wild man. He was a loose was, cannon. Yeah, and he was in charge of L. Ron Hubbard Security. Who, yeah. I have no idea what was going yeah, on. Yeah, who would have guessed, right? Yeah. All right, thanks for the question. We got a super chat here. Thank you so much. If you've got any more questions, put them in now because we'll cut them off here shortly. But we're going to answer everybody's questions here. All right, we got a super chat from Pete in Toronto. Thank you so much. 167 watching, now less 107 likes. Well, we actually have 278 watching because this super chat was from a while ago. 60 um, dB out of the my, downstairs. Uh, 60 dB <laughs> downstairs out exchange deadbeats. Not all of you, uh. Kibiosa. Hit like, USPs. That is freaking yeah. awesome. <laughs> freaking love it, Pete. Thanks so much for that great Try, humor. Hit, hit, hit our like button, subscribe, notifications, and send us you know the Super Chats too, as well as your questions, okay? Yeah. Thanks very much, Pete. We really appreciate it. And we'll go to the next question here. Susanna Pimentel. Uh, question, you two are doing great. Interested to hear your experiences. Very interesting. Thank you. Happy to hear you are heart and soul free. Enjoy this wonderful world. Thank Thanks you, Susanna. So yeah, we appreciate it. That's that. awesome. And uh, we enjoy telling our stories and, and speaking. And we got a super sticker here from Mahabharata and Espanol. Wow. Super sticker. Thank you so much for that super sticker. The Next count question. in its own to be able to pronounce some of these names. Next one, Sarah Hicks. Question: Does Jackson have any stories of Jason Begay? Just small interactions with him when he was at the base doing films, and then uh, uh, my life afterwards, getting to hang out with him. Um, very gentle soul, freaking comedy, great. He's just a guy's guy to hang out with. Um, tells the meanest, greatest jokes. He's a loving, loving father. Um, yeah, uh, you know, I got to I got to help him on a very personal matter at one time, and he was very humble soul about it when we were in Florida together. And um, yeah, I, you know, I don't like to elaborate on it because you know what, um, it was Sarah, hi Sarah, um, you know, he lives a very publicized life, so I just I I tend to uh, be motivated to respectfully keep that respectfully private because. It's my experience, but it brings his name into it, and I don't, I don't know. I just don't think he would like it. I don't know. Maybe he would. My first draw is, I'm sorry, I, I, I can't elaborate on it, and just respectfully, I don't. Out of respect for for Jason. So, um, okay, yeah, thanks. Just Jeff. I had a lot of fun time. I think our birthdays are on the same date too, by the way. Yeah. Okay. Next question, SP Kitty. Question, Jackson. Did you think you were asked to do? Was, do you think what you were asked to do was crazy at any point or so indoctrinated it didn't occur to you to question it? This is fascinating but scary. Yes, ma'am. Uh, SP Kitty. <laughs> um, at the time I was doing it, there were, were blips of this is crazy, but I'm now in the, in, the, in the thick of it and I have to continue doing it. I would then use that learned experience to apply to future stuff. Um of scenarios that uh, I would find myself in. Yeah, at any point, this I was just, it was indoctrinated. I was self-serving in that this is for the person's greatest good. This is for their good, why I'm doing it. I'm not, I never once did it pass my mind that I'm doing this to protect the church in terms of legal fallout um, or exposure. It was all driven to truly, because I, I wholeheartedly, felt that I was defending every staff member as an individual on that base and thus preserving the future of Scientology. If I, if I failed at my job, that meant Scientology, so Scientology could be wiped out really easily. If, if there was an atmosphere that people knew they could just hop those fences and come in and change the place, um, that I wasn't doing my job. So, um, yeah, I, yes, I did think that what I was being asked to do there was crazy points where I go, wow, this this is just screwed up. But um, okay, thanks a lot, SP Kitty. Next question here, we've got a super chat. Love Sherlock. Hi, love Sherlock. Uh, oh no, Nora. Nora said that they have a huge arsenal now. I think we already answered that question. Well, yeah, I, and quite yeah. honestly, I don't know how Nora would come to know that. I don't even think she ever made it to the base. But um, that it's it's not wise to generate something that we truly know nothing about. So that's my answer to the thing. Yeah, and, and, and also, Jackson, to be fair, we haven't been there in years, so no. we don't know, you know. All I can tell you is what took place what up to the last day there. that I was there. And yeah, 
And uh, yeah, I don't think it does our efforts here any good by trying to yeah. say Next something. Next question, Supreme Rulah. Peter Schles, that's really sad to hear. How did he get there? By Dave uh, Miscavige. Peter, yeah, well, Peter Schles, he, he got involved in Scientology at some point in the 1980s. And he actually, where how he got in was the Portland Crusade um, when uh, Scientology lost a huge lawsuit to Julie Christopherson up in Portland, Oregon. They decided to have a huge crusade to protest the decision and eventually got the judge to throw out the, throw out the case. But Peter Schles was up there. Uh, and he was a uh, piano, you know, a keyboard player and a musician. And he basically was in charge of the band that was up there. And he got Frank Stallone up there, Edgar Winter up there, lots of different uh, people. And then from there, we brought him up to the base a couple of times to actually work on the Mission Earth album and, and some other things. And then he decided to join the Sea Organization. And so yep, he, Dave uh, actually himself brought him into this. Dave. He waived, didn't he waive his requirements? Yeah, like, required no everything. LP. He didn't need anything yeah. special. To, unlike everybody, the other 800-some-odd staff that had to be there, Peter just yeah. walked right in the door. Yeah, with his wife, Karen, at the time. Yeah. And Karen worked in marketing, and she uh, she was a designer. Actually, she was a designer at first. And Karen, of course, is out now, and she's written yeah. books, and she's she's a wonderful person as well. She was a beautiful woman then, and she's a beautiful woman now. It's just yeah. such a great soul, and I can tell you that's a whole separate story of of uh, a one person's life that was ruined that I had hands on dealings with. Oh my gosh. Okay. Thank, thanks so much, Supreme Rula. Next uh, question Mary Klein Jackson and Mark truly wonderful, truly worked beautifully together while Mark was telling his epic story. Well, thank you so much. We appreciate that, Mary Klein. And cool we've got a thumbnail another... there with the peace sign, by the way. I, that's really cool. Yeah. Here comes another super like chat, that. super chat. Cindy Lou Woohoo 64. <laughs> do either one of you know if there was a Scientology location in Indianapolis, Indiana? I missed a bullet in 81, 82 as a friend tried to get me into the cult. I don't I'm know. There may have been a mission there, but there was I'm never sorry, an Cindy. I don't. Yeah, I can't answer that for you. Yeah. Well, it's good that you missed that bullet because a yeah. lot of people, you know, did. And uh, we're glad that you never got involved. Mm -hmm. So thank yeah. you, Cindy Lou. We really appreciate that. And we'll go to the next one. We've got another super chat here from Love Sherlock. Nora said this is in L.A. at the Celebrity Center. It must be talking about the Arsenal. Again, I don't have any knowledge about that. I mean, maybe there is something at Celebrity Center. But I yeah, don't I knew PAC Security, the L.A. area. They had they had some form of firearms. And especially after the, the riots in L.A., there was a different concern that shit like that can happen in Los oh, Angeles. Oh, yeah, that, that's a good so, point. So uh, I do know stuff was obtained, what it was and where it was kept. I had no need to know. I didn't know. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. Hey, thanks maybe, a lot, Sherlock. We appreciate that clarification. Yeah. Here comes our next question here. Deviant Outcast. Security is much, much, sorry, security is much more than keeping folks in check. Security is about keeping folks safe. Jackson, you have the heart of one wanting to keep people safe. It's, it's a beautiful thing. Hope you know that. <laughs> well, thank you, Deviant Outcast. And yes, I, I genuinely took to heart my my job and the purpose that I served and what I was there for. And uh, I got to know and help the locals in the local areas outside of my fence. It was really, uh, and then more importantly, every staff member in that base was somebody that I was concerned about on a daily basis. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Next question here. Colonel Brock. Hi, Colonel Brock. What was LRH's favorite car? I actually don't know because I was well, never around him. I have an answer to that. From what I was told, it was a powder blue Dodge Dart. I think it was a 64 Dodge Dart that he had redone. It, it didn't have it, a souped up engine. It had a V8 in it uh, with mag wheels and a white leather interior with a white um, white uh, soft top. Well, it actually was a hard top coated with a... Uh, I almost wanted to say leather, but you know, people know what I'm talking about. It wasn't a metal roof, but, um, and I had even understood there to be a story where LRH was, or Hubbard was driving that, was sitting in a red light, and he just wanted to exercise the muscle that thing had. What a gentle grandma that car that it appeared to be, but you stepped on that gas and it just wrinkled the asphalt, yeah. and that made him giggle every time he did it. But he specifically had that so he could leisurely drive around town, blend in, but he had means of getting away if he needed to. So, Beautiful Jackson, car, saw it every day. Jackson, let me ask you this question. Do you remember 
the Peterbilt that uh, JB and James Hall were working on in the garage. Yeah, uh, that bulletproof. It was that? all white outside, all white inside. Uh, yeah, I was. I got to see it as they were building it with all the 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 uh, uh, bulletproofing fiberglass yeah. panels that were being put in. It was very kind of. You know, at the time, it was very advanced and luxurious. It was a it was, Peterbilt truck. Like yeah, it was a Peterbilt tractor. Yeah. Yeah, it, with a big old box put on the back. So it looked like and it a was very... For, it, was to, it was to transport LRH, right? Yeah, so he could yeah. securely get around. It was, you know, he couldn't be wider than, more wider than the white. And you'd wonder why it just didn't blend in more. But yeah, that that was something that was the JB himself went and pick, picked up. It was pit, purchased in um, Fontana at a... a Kenworth or Peterbilt facility and JB drove it to the base and nobody could see it. So it was kind of time that yeah. as JB was getting close, he was only certain people could go in. Yeah. Yep. He was radioing in. They literally rolled up the garage door. It drove in the garage door shut. Nobody, nobody knew that it was there. Yep. But it was uh, basically an L Reich security escape vehicle. Yeah. As soon as he died, it was gone. Once L Reich died. It yeah. Was gone. And they, they also had the bulletproof uh, uh, van too, the dark yep. blue van. Uh, it had custom interior with the with the captain seats and the sound system and all that and the and then the the smoke screen the oil spill i remember yeah that was all it was all set up to if he was being chased it had a transmission fluid injector into the manifold that would create an intense smoke screen behind it and he had an oil dump to uh, dump oil on the ground to have any following cars wipe out it and so yeah okay great Thank you so much, Rusty. Super chat. It seems to me your real life begins after you leave this church of Scientology. How long did it take to really feel free? Uh, for me, it was like almost immediately. I mean, I felt, you know, uh, I'll tell you the thing I remember the most is being able to go out. I don't drink coffee, but I go to like a Winchell's donut shop, buy the Sunday newspaper, buy some donuts and a Diet Coke and just sit around reading the paper and enjoying it. That's that's what I recall. You want to know that that moment of sweet a taste of freedom for me was when I hopped the fence, I was out trying to get to my wife. So I had that mission I had trying to overcome mentally, but I ran from the imp base, uh, for miles and miles and miles along the riverbed and Mark this, this, you'll understand this down the Ramona expressway, all the way out to East Hemet to where the Ramona expressway connected with Florida Avenue at the East end. And there was a circle K there. And with the very little, I had a buck 70 some odd, <laughs> A dollar and change in my stuffed in my sock in my shoe so it wouldn't rattle while I ran and escaped. I purchased me a pint of chocolate milk, ice cold. I never forget walking in there and go, I want some chocolate milk. And uh, grabbed it, turned around, went outside. And this was a brand new Circle K, so it was all fresh and new. And I sat on the, the bus bench out there and I looked at the sunrise coming up behind Mount San Jacinto. And it, it was that cool early morning feeling on my skin and that the, the taste in the refreshment of that chocolate milk. That was sweet freedom feeling right there. That I, You know, that was the beginning of my taste of what it was like to no longer be under the, the, the wrenches of the Church of Scientology in the imp base. Okay, Never great. forget that moment. Listen, we're about to wrap up. We've got a few questions left. If you have any other questions, get them in right now. Super chat us. And uh, super sticker us if you like, and we appreciate it. And here's our next. We've got a super sticker, super chat here from Cindy Lou Wu, 64. Jackson, woohoo! Uh, woohoo! Oh, uh, <laughs> woohoo! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Cindy Lou. Next question here. <clears throat> question. Do they keep LRH cars like they do when his clothes, like they do with his clothes in his house? Yep. I got to see all of his all of his old school clothes, platform shoes, his boots, his hats, his gloves, his, his ascots. Um, got to walk into that facility all the time. And then, yes, his cars. He had a number of cars. He had a, a white limousine. He had the bulletproof van. He had the Bluebird bus that arrived to the base after he passed on. Um, uh, yeah. The, so there was that. He had the motorcycle. Um and uh yeah and then dave started storing his own personal cars in the same garage so uh there was uh one two three four there was four or five or six vehicles of l ron hubbard's vehicles that were there at that base the okay. the bulletproof blue van was sold off considered to be a pr floppage image no longer needed so we took the money and value from that turnaround to use to buy you remember when gold got its new fleet of vehicles yeah 
John Horowitz sold that van and um, turned around and used the money to help buy the new fleet of gold vehicles. Okay. Thank you very much for that question. Next question. Love Sherlock question. Jackson, what was the first fun thing you did after blowing and the second fun thing for Mark? First fun thing I did blowing. Um, I took a vacation for the first time with my good friends, him and his wife or girlfriend at the time and flew to Louisiana, went to the French quarter, um, had me a hurricane and, uh, it was like I had this, um, what turned out to be a religious experience where we walked into the house of blues and I had no idea of these two performers or artists, Layla Hathaway and Joe Sample were there playing that night at the house of blues in Louisiana. And that was like a religious experience. Um, I then as a result, uh, bought, uh, their musical albums have been following ever since, but we drove from there to Florida and on the way we visited the little town um that was uh what was that jim carrey movie um where he lived in a simulated world oh, you're talking about truman show to the truman show we visited that town and where the truman show was shot and the funny thing was with a little bit of trivia for me is that very same concept was in my head i used to sit up at eagle and look out and believe that everybody out there in the distance was there for a show for us at the end base it was weird when that movie came out i was like how did they know that i used to think that but that was my first little fun little thing that I did shortly after, within months of my leaving. And I got to see ZZ Top. <laughs> that was fun. And um, yeah, rollerblading and just having a good time. Jackson, you probably don't know this, but uh, the first thing I did right when I left, after I left you going through my stuff, is I took my car and I drove up the Pacific Coast Highway to San Francisco up the PCH1. I'd always wanted to do it, and I drove up there, and I stopped at San Simeon and saw the Hearst Mansion, and I went to wow. Monterey, California, and then I went up to uh, San Francisco, and then I drove across to Lake Tahoe, and then I drove all the way down to Las, uh, Las Vegas, and then from Las Vegas, I drove to San Diego. So that was the first thing that I did after I left. Man, you got uh, a beautiful road trip right there. I, I was hitting the highway, man. I was like, you know. Yeah. Depressing, let's put it that way. Yeah, yeah, and then I realized when I hit Las Vegas, what am I going to do now? And that's when I decided I'm going to go see Julie's family because I had nowhere else to go. So that was the first fun thing that I did. Yeah, and, incredible. Hey, I have a question right? for you. I have a question yeah. for you. Yeah. Did you ever talk to David Miscav? Did he ever talk to you about oh. me after I left? After I left? Um. He probably wanted, said derogatory things, but I mean, would, did you know? He ever, did my name ever come up as a subject? Not, not particularly. I, I do remember there may have uh, more than with Shelley than Dave himself, because there was definitely this transitional time where Dave started shutting up, talking to certain people about certain yeah. things. Um, but I can't say nothing great, Mark. Um, yeah, that's because <laughs> part of the trick of the trade is once these people, such as yourself, were gone or Janice, they were never mentioned by purpose. Right. So people never questioned, and it was all this, they're off on a special project. Well, it's funny Easy. that you mentioned that, too, because I, uh, the, funny, after you leave, you go like, did anybody miss me? Like, did yeah. anybody care, you know? And I, you nope. remember, you just said it, It's you become a non-person. They yeah. don't even talk about you anymore. Or you're you're on a special project. That was, yeah. Uh, it's, yeah. All right, next question. We got two left here, and then we're we're done. Deviant Outcast question: Other than chasing after runaways, was there any security work aimed towards the safety of those at the base? E.g., risk assessment, risk management, education, fire drills, HLR education. Yes, and until Jackson came along, it was all haphazardly dealt with. There was no respect or regard towards OSHA standards and safety for the staff and systems. We had an official. Um, um, gases chlorine leak on the north side of the property that RTC staff almost indirectly and innocently walked into this cloud of pure chlorine that had been released from the ship. Um, part of the plumbing went bad and released pure chlorine into the atmosphere. Wow. And for those educated individuals that know chlorine looks like a low lying cloud that moves yeah. with the flow of air. And it went right across this main sidewalk that one travels to and from uh, the eating facility back up. And literally, staff would have dropped like flies if they would have taken. They would have thought they were walking in. It was not uncommon to see little 
little clouds of, of fog floating around that property certain times of year. So they would have walked right into it not knowing. And and I became aware of these things through my firefighting training and made the staff awareness up on these things, started pushing Martin and the state's crew to start looking and getting these standards in and meeting them. Um, Mike Tomazovic had liquefied chlorine sprayed in his eyes out the deep well pump remotely all by himself, almost lost his eyesight. Um, there were industrial incidents and accidents that occurred at that base. And this whole risk management, that was something that I took dear to my heart and started um, instituting at the base and educating staff on. And I became very passionate about it. I became very knowledgeable about it. And it was really the first time that base had started seeing those standards. Outside of meeting building code compliance to uh, building permits, um, you know, risk assessment, I was doing the earthquake drills, did a whole bunch of studies and figuring out on that to fires and floods and earthquakes. So, yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, just still 250 people here. Wow. And we want to thank you for sticking around. This is the last question. Here. My boring crap that I have to say. Yeah. Surprising. <laughs> this is the last one. The pickles and bacon show wow. question. Do you know what happened to Alexandra powers? And I think she was married to Gavin Potter. I don't know who those people are. I know who Gavin Potter is. That's the son of, um, Leslie and uh, what's his name, Potter, that took Neville, care of Mary Sue Hubbard. Neville Potter. Neville Potter, that's correct. In terms of Ag Alexandra Powers, I do remember her. Um, I don't know the disposition of them. I'm sorry. Okay, well, thank you so much. Listen, we want to thank everybody uh, for being here. And please remember to subscribe to our channels. We Jackson and I both need more subscribers. And... Uh, also, hit that like button and notifications. I know you guys know all of this stuff. If you haven't subscribed, please do so already. We want to thank you all for sticking around. We still have 253 people here, but uh, we could go all night. But I know Jackson's got to go to sleep now, and I've got some other things that i got to take care of. But uh, uh, Jackson, say thank you so much for uh, joining me. Uh, have you got anything else you want to say? I just, it, it, it means so much to me that 251 people right now and that fluctuates would take their time to come and hear the crap that I have to say. And I am very hopeful or, you know, and I don't say crap on your behalf, Mark, but humorously, <laughs> I say the crap that you and I have to say. Um, it means a lot in, especially in this community, this environment that we all found ourselves part of the, the navigating through it. This, this, this individual I spoke to today had never heard about these channels and us doing this. So I helped direct them to, come listen and hopefully find this therapeutic to help them through their issue. And, um, I just love it. It's, it's incredible to think there's actually people sitting here listening to this I know. right here. Right. Yeah. No, <laughs> so I'm great. not being hard on myself. It's just, you know, it's, it's, um, it's beautiful. It's such a beautiful thing. It and is. Thank you all. It is. Well, yeah. thank you so much, Jackson. Stick around. Um, I'm going to play the outro video, and then I'll talk to you just in one second. Okay. Hey, thank you, everybody, for watching. We'll see you the next time, okay? Bye-bye.